Hey, welcome on back to the Zero Cool Podcast. Shout out to Scott Cushman joining us. Before we get into that, uh, a couple of shouts I want to give. Uh, number one, I got the opportunity this past weekend as uh, we hosted the fights over at Brothers. Uh, I had the opportunity to run out to uh, Mojo MKE, which is formerly Rogue's Gallery, which is now owned by uh, Dano, Dano's fiance Sarah and Todd, who were originally from uh, Scooters and uh, Dukes on Water, and uh, they went and did their own thing. Got the opportunity to have a couple of drinks after the fight, got to see them, really excited for them and, and all the things that are, that are going to be going on this summer for them. Uh, also, big shout out to Brothers for hosting the fights this past Saturday. If you were there, uh, thank you for coming through. We had a number of people in our private back room. Uh, it, it got a little cramped, but uh, I think we had a great time. I think we're uh, for sure going to be doing this again next month for the next pay-per-view with Stipe and uh, Francis Nuganu. Um, also, a uh, big shout out to Nomad. I got to watch the Derby this morning with uh, my good friend Tony Lopez, and uh, of course United won two nil. So that was a great, that was a great win to start off the day today. Also, a big shout out to um, Uncle Bucks. They were able to take all the overflow from Brothers, and and they were hosting the fights over there as well. Uh, I know it was kind of hard due to the COVID restrictions and capacity and stuff like that. People wanted to get in and see it at Brothers. Uh, thankfully, uh, Ricardo and Lawrence and the guys over at Uncle Bucks were able to accommodate all the people that were in line and take them over there. Um, I believe they're going to be doing this from here on out. This is going to be a regular thing that they're going to be doing. So if you're not able to get in at Brothers, uh, the overflow will be going over to Uncle Bucks. And they have an amazing space up there, up on the upper deck that they're doing on the on the top two floors. So they'll be able to comfortably watch the fight, socially distance, enjoy some food, and enjoy some drinks. Um, having said that... Uh, going back to what I was saying before about brothers, we were able to watch an amazing card this past Saturday. Um, I was bummed to not see Stylebender win, but I thought it was a great fight. I think we learned a lot about Stylebender in, in 259. Um, I think taking him down in the middle of the cage, uh, it, it's a little hard for him to, to get back up, but um, I was really impressed with how he was able to avoid the takedown, his takedown defense up against the cage. Uh, when uh, Bl- I, Ian Blockowitz, I was saying that correctly. Jan Blockowitz, I believe. Yeah, La- Jan Blockowitz. Um, his takedown defense up against the cage, but when you take him out, or when you try and take him down, um, towards the more center of the cage, it was harder for him to get up, and it seemed that that was a disadvantage for him. Would you agree or disagree on that, Kush? Yeah, it's it's definitely it's it's hard. I mean, the cage is actually your friend. When it, if you know how to use a cage, you can use a cage to help you stay standing. I mean, you can use it for leverage and everything else. So if you can get the takedowns in the middle of the cage, it's always better. And yeah, in his style of fighting, when he leans back, if you can avoid that and still going for the takedowns, you know that's obviously an advantage. I uh, I thought um, the first two rounds were more so to the advantage of Stylebender, where he was warming up and he was kind of tagging uh, at distance and he was slipping a lot. Um, I, were you surprised how it went in the later rounds in the fourth and fifth that he was taken down and really just held down towards the later uh, rounds in the fight? No, not really. I think um, I think he was, Jan might have wanted to do that a little earlier, but Stylebender was, uh, Israel is pretty uh, still fresh, so it was a little harder. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he waited a little bit, and the first couple rounds were a lot closer than people think. You know, it's uh, I I actually had Jan win in the first round, mm-hmm. and uh, so I think it's uh, he he didn't get enough. I don't think he got enough credit for what he did defensively. You know, Stylebender is obviously a better pure striker and everything, but Jan has a really funky style that rhythm. The rhythm is different, and sometimes that's hard to defend. And uh, he did a really good job defensively. He did some things that a lot of people didn't do against uh, Israel. Yeah. Um, do you think? I mean, do you think the weight advantage uh, helped Jan with keeping him down? Because I mean, I've rolled with guys that are heavier than me, and it's a lot, especially when there's like maybe a twenty or thirty pound difference of trying to get up and trying to regard and trying to stand back up, or even hitting a sweep or, or anything to be able to get back on your feet. Do you think that helped him at all? Oh, definitely. It's, I mean, and, and Jan's, Jan's a solid, you know, jiu-jitsu player also. And not only did he, he didn't try to do a lot on the ground. That's why he probably didn't do as much damage, but he stayed in half guard. And it's a lot harder to probably get up from there than it is from all the things. If he would have went to Mount earlier, uh, Israel might have been able to get some bumps and, you know, buck him off or something. But I think he did a really good job keeping him 
keeping him and and staying in half in his half guard and keeping him on the ground. He didn't like he said he didn't do a lot of damage there, but he did enough to win the fight. Yeah, Stylebender didn't look like he took a lot of damage in the fight in the post interview. I don't know if it was the fact that he can just wear it really well, or there are some guys that when you when you kind of tag him a little bit, they really wear it, and he yeah. didn't seem like one of those guys that that really wears it. Um, there's something else I was gonna say about that fight. I totally got distracted there for a second, but um, no. Uh, as far as um, the middleweight division goes with with Stylebender, then do you feel that anyone can use what they saw that Jan did um, as far as maybe the questions that people had on on how to take out Stylebender in that division? Do you think maybe that question might have been answered? That there might have been something revealed there in the sense that you know, taking him down in the middle of the cage might be the key to to keeping his to keeping him under control. You saw that with um, oh, I'm trying to remember his name now. Uh, two fights ago, I might have to look this back up. Uh, he was a 170. He actually fought. Wow, I have a lot of notes. <laughs> he actually fought um, Tyron Woodley, but he came in overweight, and I'm trying to remember what his name is now. Oh, uh, Gaslam. Gaslam, thank you. Um, Gaslam was able to take him down, and he seemed like the only guy that had success with it. Um, and I remember seeing Stylebender going for a triangle, and and that was something I wasn't used to seeing for him, but he was able to get up for it. I, I feel like he used that as an opportunity to help him stand himself right. back up. Um, do you think that's maybe a key moving forward for people to try and take him down or take him out that way as far as like for a guy like Costa? Who may, be, who may be having a rematch with him, um, maybe Gaslam in the future. What are your thoughts? Well, I think Gaslam obviously is, obviously we're talking about is Israel wearing, you know, damage. Well, Gaslam uh, is the only guy that really, you know, marked him up pretty good to him from hitting him. You know, he, he, he was in a war that fight. You know, Gaslam doesn't get enough credit for that. But at the same time, Getting him down, and like I said, it's being being disciplined enough not to go for a lot. Get him there, hold him there, and then don't win. It's not pretty, but it's winning. Stay in half guard, just controlling him, doing just enough to stay there. And I think that's what that's what Jan did really well. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of guys could take that notes from him. You know, as far as what to do, don't do too, don't try to do too much. Where uh, Israel can't be explosive to trying to get out, and it's hard to do that out of half guard. Yeah. Yeah, you know, especially when you just stay heavy on him. He didn't open up, try to open, you know, he didn't try to posture up and rain down blows, which gives him the guy in the bottom space to move and everything. And Jan, like I said earlier, Jan didn't get enough credit. I don't think no one talked about enough his defense. He was, yeah, he was biting on the feints and that, but uh, Israel's uh, style, you know, against Casa, he takes out the lead leg, he side kicks the lead leg, the leg kicks, the hand fighting. And. Jan, I, th- I feel, kind of neutralized that. He did a really good job blocking leg kicks, blocking that side kick to the leg, which sets up a lot of his other stuff and forces guys to come in hard. And I think Jan did a really good job uh, uh, handling that where a lot of other guys didn't. Yeah, you know, that was actually something that Duke talked about this past week. Well, we were both in advanced kickboxing together um, about using that lead leg strike, whether it was uh, we had talked about the one to the thigh and then being able to transition with that rush that he had picked out that he goes, you know, this is something that Stylebender does really well. Um, I'm thinking back now to that lead leg kick that he does a lot. You are correct. He does throw that a lot. He throws that to the calf. He throws that to the thigh. But he also does that that straight thigh kick that he does a lot, and he sets that up yeah. that way. He actually throws a side kick. He throws it at the side kick. It's not like a teep to the body. He actually he side kicks to the leg and everything. And it keeps people off balance. It makes them, you know, it really makes it hard for them to come forward off of that. And it's, just, it's not doing crazy amount of damage, but it allows uh, Israel to set up a lot of other things, and it makes other people, the other guys, hesitant. And the reason he had so much success with it is nobody just tried to block it. And a block is pretty simple. You're literally just picking up the front of your leg, and it's a straight. You don't have to turn your leg, and you just pick the knee up. And Jan was the first guy to do that. So many people see that. It's like, oh, block that one kick, and that changes everything. Now it's not going to be the end all, but at the same time, it it changes, makes Israel go to a different a different setup yeah. and that he might not normally want to. 
Were you surprised at the result at all? Did you have Stylebender winning this, or did you have Jan, well, winning, I had Jan this? winning all the all the way? I mean, the only thing I would say on the score was the uh, ten eight round in the fifth round. I mean, yeah, he, he had him down for half the round, but he didn't do crazy damage. So I don't I don't agree with the ten eight. I mean, I think the the judging needs to be a little bit more advanced. Where you know they like oh they, they, they I think sometimes they throw out. 10 8 rounds for the control. It's if you, to me is you don't do 10 8 rounds unless you're doing damage. You know, not just the control on the ground. If you're throwing up crazy submissions and making that guys pure 100% defensive, but if you're just on top of them controlling them and not doing a lot of damage, I don't think that warrants a 10 8 round. You bring up a you bring up a good point about the scoring. Um do you do you like the 10 the 10 point must system? Yes. Okay, yeah. and then would what would you see as far as we're we're gonna segue for a second? What would you see as far as improvements to scoring goes, or how scoring goes? Um, I just think the judges need to be a little bit more um, understanding of what what does damage. It's like yeah, you know, like in boxing, you go you change. Uh, you go to a knockdown. A fighter automatically wins the round if he knocks a guy down. He automatically gets a two point round. I don't necessarily agree with that 100%. If it's a flash knockdown and the guy pops right back up and he doesn't really do a damage there, he still it shouldn't be lost ten, uh, two points. Or if he's dominating the round and he gets a flash knockdown, I don't think he should necessarily lose. That was one punch. It didn't make major change. Now, if he almost knocked him out where the guy could barely get back up and barely survive the round, yes, that's a 10 eight round. And that's what they have to translate more into MMA. You know, to me, it's like this 10 8 round is when you do damage. Yeah. You know, and, you know, and they, in MMA, they scored takedowns more than they scored a knockdown. Well, takedown, yes, takedowns count and it's good, but people don't get knocked out from takedowns. Uh, they have been the slams and everything yeah. else, 100%. But, and then there'll be injuries once in a while on the takedowns. But they, uh, they don't, if you don't, if you drop a guy where you drop him and, and he's hurt, and they don't give them enough credit for that. Even leg kicks, they don't score leg kicks as enough. You know, you can watch significant strikes, and uh, what they what they show on the screen. I don't believe that's a hundred percent accurate on what they show and what's you know what do what do they deem a significant strike? Yeah, there's some there's some nasty leg kicks out there yeah. where you you hear it, and it sounds like a baseball yeah. got hit, and it's you know, and and you have you see guys come out of a round and they got that stiffness to that leg. I don't think people know the true damage of what an inside leg kick does to someone where you can feel the muscle kind of seizing up in that thigh or the fact that, you know, when you go to the outside part of the leg on the lead leg on the on the leg kick of what that feels like to try and walk on that, the, yeah. especially when someone, you know, strong kickers like Eric Koch back in the day, uh, Anthony Pettis currently, those guys are some guys that can throw some kicks and, you know, whether or not people believe it or not, they do cause significant damage, yeah. especially when it's hit cleanly. Well, Someone that doesn't check that. What people don't realize, too, it's not just the kicks, but it's the sitting down, standing back up in between rounds. I mean, you sit down, it's like, you know, if a guy gets his leg torn, maybe, you know, it's like you have to, you, some, if he's sitting down, somebody should be working on that leg, massaging it, not just icing it, massaging it and keeping it working. Because, I mean, you it will go, it will literally lock up on you. And you can see, you can see people affect their movements, but I mean, a lot of guys they don't check them because of uh, takedowns and everything else. But there's also a lot of guys they don't throw them as well as you know a lot of people think. The pure strikers, like I remember when I used to help Duke train for fights, I'd hold a kick shield, and my from my hip down to my knee, I'd be black and blue from his leg kicks, and that's with a big heavy duty kick shield. Yeah. Not this one you'd see in a class, but a big heavy duty one. And he'll even say, if you if you don't make a guy almost fall down off of five or six leg kicks, you're not kicking that hard. So you see, oh, he's eating 20 low kicks. And I mean, to me, it's like, I mean, when you talk about world-class striking, I've seen Duke in his, his last fight, you know, he literally kicked the dude maybe six, seven times, and a guy would could barely stand. So, and that's, you know, so if leg kicks count, you know, but referees, some of them have never felt a leg kick. So yeah. they don't realize what what you know how much damage it really does. You know they you know they go oh the control the takedown yes controls there but it's also fighting's about doing damage. Oh judges you yeah, said ref yeah, yeah okay sorry referee yeah 
judges that yeah, they should feel a leg kick once in a while. You know, well, it's like this is how this feels. This is why it does damage. Yeah, know? they're they're brutal. Um, we've gone over those before in class where it's. You know, I've, I've seen Duke where he uses as an example where, you know, you get space, you're literally stepping out and he's throwing it like a soccer free kick where he's just blasting someone in the leg. Um, they When you can connect like that and you have that type of momentum that he builds up where he just takes that step out, where he he just steps out it's, to the side right away. It's not even a big turnover. It's like we do, we teach an up kick. We don't teach the turnover kick. Very rarely do our guys throw the low kick where you turn it over. It's a more, it's a quicker, it's up kick, mm -hmm. yeah. and you don't have to turn the kick over to do damage because the turnover kick actually makes it easier for the other fighter to grab the kicks. Oh, okay. The up kick you're gonna get a lot faster recoil, and you can still do the same amount of damage. Yeah, um, yeah. Watching him do those is is, is scary. I remember seeing that the other day in class. Um, I'm going to keep going down uh, UFC 259 here. Uh, I was not surprised at the Nunez uh, Megan Anderson no. fight whatsoever. Um, what I was, I, I don't know what they're going to do with the, this division. Um, I think Megan was probably the last 145 that they had there. I think she's been fighting at 135 and somehow qualified for the 145. I kind of see if Amanda Nunez is retiring, they might retire this division because I don't yeah. think they're. They're trying to expand yes. a division at all. No, I don't. I don't. I think they they brought that division basically for a Cyborg. Yeah. Yeah, and then Nunes, you know, smashed Cyborg. Everyone knows that. And it, it's there's not the problem with the division is there's just not enough women there, and that's why say other uh, you know, divisions or other uh, companies they don't have a one forty. They'll go to one fifty five. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's like there's there's too big of a drop off. Amanda's Nunes is way up high, and there's too much of a drop off. At 35, it's more competitive. You know, and they're talking about you know Shevchenko, uh, she her coming down, up to 35 to fight her. Oh, Valentina. You know, Valentina, yeah. yeah there, I mean, from 25, but again, she's small for you know for her. She's good size for 25, but going up to 35 where Amanda's coming down. At that size is going to be a, would be interesting. I would have to double check. I I'm pretty sure Valentina has a win over Nunes, but I thought Nunes got that one back. Um, but Valent, yeah, I think you're right. I think Valentina is a little small for the 35 division. I think she was when she was in that division before. I thought yeah. 125 was really perfect for her, and she's really, she's really had a lot of success there. Honestly, yeah. she has what we were at the the UFC Chicago card when she put Jessica I down, and that was mm. probably one of the nastiest knockouts I'd ever seen where she yeah. literally skipped her shin right off Jessica's right off the side, full, yeah, right yeah. The side of her head. Yeah. With the, yeah, with the women's, it's there's there's some there's some badass women in MMA, but I feel there's a big drop off from the top tier down, you know, down. There's not enough talent coming in. You know, there's the ones, once Amanda goes through the, the top tier women, who else is there? You know, you come bringing in, you know, women that are, might have potential, but they're, they don't have that many fights, mm -hmm. you know, and I just don't think they're going to be able to handle the pressure. And Nuna is hits like a truck. Yeah. You can just, you could see it in, uh, you could see it in, uh, Cyborg? So, no. Uh, who did you just I'm sorry. Megan Anderson. Megan, Megan Anderson, sorry. Uh, you could see it when Megan, when she first hit Megan Anderson with that right hand. She you, stopped. Her eyes got big like, what the hell was that? So I, I thought the same thing is that she came out real loose and then all of a sudden she got hit and she just kind of paused. Yeah. And then she started backing up into the cage where I was like, you know, if, if you're going to use, especially with a girl like Megan Anderson who's extremely long, who had that reach advantage going against the cage was probably a bad idea in the sense that I felt like she was going to lose her range. And that was the opportunity where Amanda could put her up against the cage, take the range away and start really pushing the gas down against her. And you, you kind of saw that where I'm trying to remember the setup now where she went leg kick, left, right hand. Yeah. Leg kick, left, right hand. And I remember Megan kind of moving to my view left. And then tried to move away, and then all of a yeah. sudden she bent. I remember she got hit again, and then kind of like went down. Yeah, she was in between of. I think she was in between doing a technique. I don't know if she's going to try to throw a knee there or not, but you could see she got hit, and her legs went straight. Like, yeah, like baby giraffe. You know, they're like when they first born, they're trying to stand up. They're all legs. When she got hit, that's what it was like. And 
No, not taking nothing away from her, but Amanda Nunes is on another, on another level right yeah. now. I mean, it's again. I don't know who who they can get. You know, they're literally searching for someone for her to fight. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone left in whether it's it's the bantamweight or the one thirty five division, the one forty five division. Because you look at the one forty five divisions as far as the ranking goes, Megan and Nunes are the only two people there. Yeah, and you look at one thirty five. Nunes has beat everyone, and then on top of that, there's no one that's coming up. Right. I think there's uh, more competition as far as the women's 115 division goes. Yeah, uh, 125, I feel like there's more women in those divisions, and there's more competition. Yeah. Excuse me. But, yeah, I don't know who who or where they go with Nunes next. Yeah. Women, it's funny. Women's 145, it's like men's, they're smaller. You know, they're light, you know, they're flying around fast. But in women's, they're like... The women's 145 is like the men's heavyweight. You know, that's, they don't, there's not too many women that are that size that can, that move that well. They're just, you know, you know, Megan Anderson is what, six foot one or six foot tall, and she probably walks around at, you know, 170, 165 at least. Oh, wow. I mean, I, I, I'm probably close to, you know, that. I mean, she's a tall girl. Yeah, and, she's I mean, six foot she's six not, one. Yeah, she's just a naturally big girl. I mean, we have a girl that's tall like that, and she's not small, and she's she's just they're just tall. Yeah, women, women are built different, so and there's just not that many women that size that are athletic and move that well. Yeah, totally. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep moving down this card. Um, I didn't know where to go or or what was gonna happen with this illegal knee with uh, the Aljamain Sterling Peter or excuse me Pewter Jan. Uh, fight. I was that the fourth or fifth round that fourth, that round. fourth round where that that knee hit. Now, according to what the commentators had to say were saying was that Pewter Jan was getting instructions from his corner to hit him while he was on his knee still. And I don't know if he just made a mistake and threw the knee or, or... his one coach from uh, I don't know his name uh, from the ATT was there, and you could hear him say just punches just punches and then his other coaches said something in russian and we don't understand and dc said that khabib was right behind him and he heard him say yeah throw the knee you know so i don't know if they didn't realize that that's still you know with the grounded opponent they don't understand you now that that rule yet so but, uh, i'm going to interrupt for one second for for the people listening that are unfamiliar with this rule because there is a lot of leeway depending on where you go in the country uh as far as uh vegas or excuse me as far as the nevada athletic commission goes what is the rule for an opponent that's down and a knee well i mean i don't know if they uh, they use uh, that new rule all the time but if the knee if one knee is down no matter what they're down they're grounded that's knee. considered a ground yeah, opponent. that's grounded if you're standing there and you have you if you have beyond you you can be <clears throat> palms down i believe that's a grounded opponent I mean, I, I again, sometimes I don't remember these rules until we get to rules meeting okay. myself. But it used to be because they made the rule because the guy would play play around with that. Oh, my finger's down. He can't hit me. Oh, he can't knee me. My finger's down. And then they'd play a little up-down game. And then guys would be like, hey, if you're playing that game, if they throw an A, that's on you. You know, you either, you either choose. You either go down or you come up. You know, and don't play that, oh, you know, that in-between game. Mm-hmm. And that's what the reason they're trying to make <clears throat> change those rules. But it's like if you're down, they want you down where you're bearing weight on your palms, you know, not just on your fingertips. You know, you see the fights a few years ago, guys would literally just, the fingers would be touching and all that and just playing the game like, oh, I'm down, I'm down, my finger's touching. And they, so they're trying to make it more clear. But until everybody does it and it's like that all the time, it's still going to be a lot of confusion. Yeah. Because even in UFC, you can go one card, he's down next card he's not but where sterling was he was clearly down on one i mean he was on one almost, knee, yeah. yeah he was almost on his butt on one knee you know he wasn't you know all all the all all uh, Pitar had to do is uh punch him there because i think he was uh, close to taking him out yeah um were you surprised that Sterling wasn't able to get his ground game going. I know Pewter didn't really want to get into it with him on the ground. He kept letting him stand back up. But were you surprised on how many shots he was taking uh, trying to get him down? No, not really because, I mean, I don't think people realized what um, the Russian Sambo is and their style of fighting. There's a lot of 
you know, grappling, wrestling, you know, jujitsu. There's a lot of it's going on there. It's just not what American fighters or American people are used to seeing. So they think, oh, you know, Aljamain Sterling is a decorated you know, wrestler, but but uh, Jan's probably been doing this stuff for you know years. That combat, you know, the combat that they use, you know, the Russian the, the, combat yeah, sambo. Yeah, combat sambo is, you know, it's literally you will see them fight. They'll wear a gi top. You know, they'll have shoes on, some of them, and then shorts, MMA gloves on. And they, you know, they, they can grapple, they can punch, they can, you know, and it's like their transitions are a lot faster. Are they using those uh, those grappling shins as well, the the kind of thinner ones that kind of wrap around the leg fully? Like the sock ones? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, I think in the amateurs they do. They have the amateur sambo, and then, you know, but they that's big, real big over there. Europe, you know, the world is real big over here, which we do... For the kids, a pancreation, mm-hmm. which is uh, no strikes to the head, but still, it's still MMA, just no strikes to the head. But with sambo, it's it's MMA. They just have a gi top on, so it's like in judo, old school judo. You take down. Why so many good people are good at submissions that do that is because they have their, they only have like thirty seconds to go for a submission. So when they they literally will throw and go for that armbar, you know, so fast. And the Russians is, is real similar to that stuff. They, they'll they transition really fast into that. So Peter Jan did a lot more grappling than I think people know about. Mm-hmm. And it's because he doesn't do it that much. Just because he doesn't do it doesn't mean he can't do it. He just prefers to strike more. Were you surprised on how, I should say, um, how quickly Sterling came out against Jan? I felt he was burning a lot of... Yeah. A lot of gas early, trying to put him away early. Yeah, he 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 was he was a little tight. He was coming out a little too fast, wasting. Honestly, I think uh, Jan was gave that first round up. He was just sitting there waiting, waiting, waiting. Because if you think, remember in the first in the second round, he he threw one right hand and he just dropped Sterling. You know, yeah, he got up right away, but it was still. It was like you know, you could you could see the difference of when Jan struck struck compared to Sterling. Sterling was a volume what I call surface striking, where when Jan threw, he he threw to take something off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like that style of striking a lot myself. So <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to pity pat. You know, I don't, when I throw, I throw. You know, it's like, so. Um, so going into that result, uh, I'm going to circle back to that. So we were discussing amongst us on what we thought that what was going to happen. Was this going to be a DQ? Was this going to be a no contest? Were they going to go to the scorecard? Uh, were you surprised, number one, Sterling not being able to get up, and then number two, them awarding him the title? Because I've never seen anything like that before. Um, what I'm not surprised. That was a wicked knee that he took. He ate it. I'm surprised he was even conscious because that was a hard knee on the ground. I mean, it was wicked. Knee. Yeah, he spit his yeah, mouthpiece yeah, out right yeah, away. I mean, you could see. I mean, I, I know some people want to say he's acting, but it's like, no, nah, he was he was concussed. He was like wobbly. He tried to get up and his legs went out from underneath him and and then but um do I not surprised he didn't get up? No. And then what as far as the rule is, if the referee said, I told him not to throw the knee, he's down and he threw it anyway. So he threw it he said that's deliberate. If he just threw it you know, in the heat of the battle, it might have been accidental mm-hmm. or he still would have might have been would have been a DQ or a regular DQ. But if he got DQ'd because of an intentional foul, that's why the uh, t- the title changed hands. So I- I'm going to kind of rewind this a little bit. So I can't remember who was refing that fight, but did they say don't throw the knee? Yeah. He said he's – he. You, you, you go back and watch. He said he's down. You know, he's the, he's down. I don't know if he said don't throw the knee, but he said he's down. He's down. Meaning, you know, anyone that understands – you know, I mean, that means you can't throw the knee. If he's a down, downed opponent means you can't knee the guy in the head. Okay. Yeah. You know, so if he would have just his hands, he could have just hit him, punched him. Everything would have been apart. He could have kicked the body. He could have kneed the body. Mm-hmm. But knee in the head went to a down appointment. It's illegal. You know, it's you got to protect, you know, because he was he's very vulnerable. Do you see them running that one back probably Definitely. within the next six months? Well, uh, six months, yeah, yeah, maybe. But I imagine it, I would say it's probably going to be right away because it was, even though I, I was actually surprised one judge had Sterling winning that, winning that three rounds to one, and I'm like, 
I, I had it 2 2 all the way. I gave the first two to Aljamain. You know, mm-hmm. volume, he just did a lot. But then uh, third and fourth round, I think Gian started, you know, taking over. And I think he, he was close to finishing before the knee. And I think he would have finished him. But then, or if he wouldn't have thrown the knee or in the fifth round, I think he would have caught him because Aljamain was pretty gassed, you know, between all the volume he put out in the first two rounds. Plus, he was started taking punishment which tires you out yeah he was getting dropped yeah getting hit is tiring i mean you could even see you know his shots that he was taking in the third and fourth rounds they were just like uh, he was reaching he was doing you know exactly so he um at that fight it was lean yeah but no it's a fight but it was leaning towards yan winning that fight i felt that's why i felt as well yeah um the next one uh islam i'm gonna screw this name up yeah mac mac see the way it's spelled is is fooling and i'm trying to remember how to say it metcalf am no, i saying that no i don't know how to say it either but okay. i know it's not that <laughs> against drew dober um everyone i've talked to have said that this guy is khabib but he's even better um he, he hasn't fought since september of 2019 comes in uh finishes drew dober uh arm triangle choke well, he, not only did he finish with arm triangle he's trying to find, finish him f- from the half guard, guard on, the yeah. op- on the opposite side and yeah that was that <laughs> which was, is like you don't see that very often we were talking about that and i was like it looks like his shoulder uh sh- big shout out to my good friend uh chicago nick and his girlfriend amanda who came up from chicago to watch the fights with us um we were talking about that and i was like that shoulder's really deep in there and all of a sudden you just see drew uh drew dober tap and i was like did did he just finish him and i couldn't tell if it was the shoulder that was uh, uh, that was putting the pressure in yeah. underneath his neck so that was more of a trick choke or if he actually just had that tight of a squeeze, because uh, Islam's back, he, he, he just constantly looks like he's flexing. He has a huge yeah. back for a guy who's 155, and you could tell that he was putting pressure on, but I just couldn't tell if he was putting the squeeze on or if it was just that shoulder. I think, well, I think it was a little bit of both, you know, okay. but, I mean, his pressure, you could I mean, Dober is very underrated. He's a very explosive guy and everything. I mean, he's not ranked and everything, but he's he's beaten some people and he's you know he's knocked some people pretty good. But he couldn't do anything. Yeah, I mean, he he was just getting manhandled. The whole, you know the whole fight, controlled the whole fight. I felt. Did you feel it was a good idea for Islam to call someone up, call someone out for the top five, as far as you know him coming back, beating an unranked opponent? And just saying flat out, give me someone in the top five right now. No. Do you think that's a good move? Do you yeah. think that's welcomed or, or deserved? I think I'm, I was actually surprised when I saw his number. I mean, you watch him fight and you say he's not number 14. And I'm like, I you know, I haven't seen him fight. i only seen him fight a couple times. But, he, I mean, he looked fantastic in that fight. And I'm, I'm there's no way he shouldn't be in the top ten. You know, I, I think he should definitely fight elite. And maybe not top five, but go from 14 to someone like maybe a 9 or a 10, mm-hmm. you know, and go from there. But he's definitely, he's going to climb a lot of fast. He's going to be tough because there's a lot of dudes above him that aren't going to want to fight him. I was thinking the same yeah. thing. <laughs> I, I You know, we had had this discussion at, you know, we were watching the fights at Brothers. We had had this discussion of who does that guy fight? More importantly, who's crazy enough to fight that guy? The only name that we could come up with was Tony Ferguson. Yeah. Coming off a loss, who doesn't give a shit, he'll fight anybody. Yeah. Um, do you think that's a good matchup to, to see going into that for the 155 division? It would be interesting. I don't know if Tony would take that fight because, I, don't, I mean, let's be real. Uh, Islam's in number 14, Tony's top five. And, you know, where, where does it put Tony? Even if he wins, he goes, well, you know, you look at, you go by numbers. If if, if uh, Ferguson beats him, well, he beat a guy that was, you know, way down in number 14. But if he loses to him, you know, you're yeah. like, oh, shit. It's, you know, it's, that makes it's, sense. It doesn't make, it's not a, it's a, it's a lose-lose, you know, for Ferguson. For, for Ferguson. But at the same time, these guys, they got to fight. You want to be the best? You got, I've been saying all the time, you want to be the best? Got to fight the best. Yeah. Everybody, you get up in the top 10, they're all killers. At 55, it's tough. Yeah, that's one hard division. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's. I mean, if you're not, they're not technically sound. They're all tough as nails or weird different styles. So it's. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. You go. I, I can name probably the top six in that division. Um, Khabib obviously is retired. Then you go Poyer. You go McGregor. You go Ferguson. You go um, the guy that um, that Anthony beat, blonde Brazilian dude. He was a one forty five er. Oh. Um, um, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm going blank. I'm blanking on his I'm, name, too. I'm terrible with the names. Uh, dang it. Le, um, Charles Oliveira. Cha- Charles Oliveira, yeah. Hooker, Paul Felder. Yeah. Um, the, the list goes on and on, and that's just a killer's row yeah. of, of amazing fighters. But, I mean, I, I, I'm i interested. I'd be excited to see him, somebody there. It's like, okay, Dober is, like I said, he's oh, under, Chandler underrated too. and everything. But, yeah, it's Chandler. It's like, where do you put this guy? I'd like to see him up against these top guys. Yeah. You know, and see, let's see where he's at now. It's like you give him somebody up there. Gaethje. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. But, again, that's a lose-lose for, yeah. for Gaethje as anyone well. Anyone in the top ten, it's like, does anyone take that fight? Yeah. You that's know? that's hard. That's I mean, because a- not only is this, he's a good, solid striker, he's he, obviously he showed he's a beast on the ground. Exactly. Yeah. Um, he was just an amazing person to watch. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm looking forward to seeing him fight again. I really want to see who they set up for him to fight next. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, moving on from uh, from the UFC 259 uh, on to a couple other fights that you have coming up. I definitely want to talk about a lot of the Rufus Sport fighters that we have in the gym that have fights coming up. One of them who is just an amazing fighter in my book. Also, amazing fighter, amazing coach, uh, Emmanuel Sanchez. He's going to be fighting Pitbull again. Uh, the first time they met, they fought in Israel in a five-round fight, which I, maybe I'm a little biased. I thought Manny won that fight. I, I thought he got hosed a little bit by the judges. But, you know, this time around, I think Manny's an even more complete fighter. I think he understands everything a little bit more. Um, go ahead and elaborate. You know, first, before we even get into that, um, tell me a little bit on how Manny came to the gym because he's not someone that came up in the Rufus program. He was someone that came to Rufus. Can you can you tell me a little bit about him? Yeah, Manny. Uh, I believe he he fought like up in Oregon. He's from his family's in Illinois and everything. But you know they're you know Mexican immigrants. I mean, and he's he's literally salt of the earth. Manny's one of the best people around, and um, he the kid has just worked. He doesn't talk about you know a lot, but what he used to do, he used to like work at a job third shift. He used to wash dishes, and he would like literally come up, drive up an hour and a half sleep in his car for a couple hours, come train, go either sleep in his car or go back where he can go to work, and then repeat. That's what he did. And it's like maybe stop at his place in Illinois to get clean clothes and everything else. But it's something what he had to do until he eventually moved up here. And once he got into Bellator he um, and he got started making some decent money, he, he does fights full time. But he still coaches. He coaches the little kids at our gym, you know, do j- jits. So... He's uh man. He's just a great guy, and he. I mean, he's. I think he he bought he bought his bought his mom a nicer car than what he drives. Yeah. You know he he's you know, he, see, he bought a house. He's like a block away from the gym. He you know he, he so he's right there. So I mean he's he's in a life changing situation right now with this tournament and fighting for the belt. Yeah. Let, let me elaborate on on this tournament. Number one, it's it's the one. Yeah, it's the one thirty five. No, I'm 45. sorry, one forty five division. They're having a million-dollar tournament. Right now, he's in the semifinals. Um, he has the opportunity to fight uh, Pitbull for the second time. Uh, and, and with Pitbull being the champion for Bellator uh, in this tournament, the title is on the line. He has the opportunity to win a title and then go into the final or go into the finals mm-hmm. a champion and then win a million dollars as well. Right. Um, how do you feel Manny has improved from the first time that Pitbull and him fought each other? I think number one thing, Manny is always he's a machine. He's 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 never gets tired. His his endurance is a weapon. I mean, he hardly ever u- loses the last couple rounds in a fight because he's able just to keep going or bring it up a notch. Um, he's obviously working on you know his his you know his skills and everything else. But I think one of the biggest things is is that he's figured out his diet and eating properly and everything else. Because he, when he first fought Pitbull. He came in underweight, a little lighter than he wanted to, and I think he was a little flat. He didn't have much weight to put back on, mm-hmm. and I think that affected him because he, he even see watch on the ground. Usually, when Manny's on his, if he gets taken down, he's on his back. He's he's throwing elbows. He's throwing up submissions. He's he. I mean, he makes it hard for guys to do anything on the ground. And this fight with Pitbull, he got got kind of his first fight with Pitbull. He was kind of flat on his back and doing a little bit, but not a lot. And I think this fight now, since that fight, he's really dialed everything in. Him and his girlfriend, Stacy Blythe, she's uh, really helped him a lot with that. And he's much stricter on himself. He used to get, you know, uh, 
a lot heavier in between fights now he's like it's man used to, <laughs> man he's easy to uh, when he cuts weight it's easy now it mm-hmm. used to be it used to be a nightmare you know he'd be like man let's go let's go and he got kind of flake out because he's just depriving himself of not eating right and he'd make weight but you know when you do that do it that way your performances are up and down where i think now he has everything dialed in well yeah you take a look at his last fight at the beginning of this tournament you know he was all gas all gas no breaks yeah. he was going to the body he was attacking the legs going up and down and then just relentless um yeah. if i recall correctly it was a unanimous decision i think at one point someone gave him a uh 10-8 round yeah uh as part of that win um yeah he he, he white chills i mean he lost I still so again I feel he beat Weichel the first time, and where Weichel because after the next day after that fight I saw Weichel in a in a lobby the hotel and he was like still had his arm over his you know one of his trainers corner or shoulders because he was making it hard to walk, where it's like in this time he's probably the same thing, but he also his ribs were probably pretty sore because Manny was tearing the body up yeah you know and it's like and that's one thing Manny lacked you know he wasn't. Um, getting finishes or he wasn't doing a lot of damage he was just outworking people now he's submitting people he's doing damage and everything else well he's jumped up there i think i in, in how do i put this i think daniel the, the the last opponent that manny fought showed that he was really tough because he ate a lot of damage yeah. those you heard those body shots you heard those leg kicks you saw him ball up and then literally it was just one of those he was just tagging the body at will um, I don't think a lot of people can take that and still stand. Um, as far as far as Manny goes, uh, I think he showed a lot, but I think he also the opponent they fought was really tough to be yeah. able to take that and continue to go into the fourth yeah. and fifth round, yeah. and especially in the fifth round where I felt like his gas tank was where Daniel's gas tank was gone, and Manny still was all gas, yeah. all gas, still attacking. Well, after I mean, you you go to the fights and it's like. A lot of people don't see it on TV and everything, but when we come up into the in the cage, you know, we see the people that are working. You know, Big John was there, and some of the other people that for the Bellator, you know, they they know everybody and they've seen the fights, them all fight before and everything, and they were just like, wow, they were like, they were just so impressed with what Manny did in that fight, where it's like. That's when everyone's, you know, any other fighter should be taking a step. Oh, it's a different Manny. Yeah. You know, Manny always had that motor, but now he's got a little bit more pop. He's got a little, you know, everything else. Because, like I said, the first fight with Weichel, I still felt like they did a little bit war, uh, more to win. But it was a war. Well, this one was just, Manny just put put it on him. Uh, class was in yeah, session. Manny, yeah. Professor Manny yeah. was, was at the helm. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Manny put it on him. And not, you don't see that happen to Weichel too often. You know, yeah. he's a tough, I mean, the guy's got over 50 fights. So it's a very durable dude that, you know, not too many people do that to him. You know, we were talking a little bit off air about uh, about that you have to be in Atlantic City. And, that, and that's in April then? Uh, that you yes. have that coming up? Yeah. So you're going to be and gone it, for about two weeks. Yes. So can can you explain to me a little bit on, because we're going to move into PFL and, and Anthony being over there. Can you explain why they're doing that with the tournament that they have coming up, that they're keeping everyone at Atlantic City to be able to do that? Um, well, they're, they're protecting the integrity of the tournament. I mean, they don't want to have to bring in somebody that's not fought yet and say, yeah, you're in the tournament because somebody else got sick. You know, they're doing it now, so they're putting us basically in a bubble uh, at the, at a resort in Atlantic City, saying that if they bring us there 17 days, 16 days before the fight, so if anyone tests for COVID, then they figured they can have enough time to either you know test out, test again, and be you know negative so that they can fight. You know, even if you know if if it's a false positive, they have time to you know fix that all. Re- refresh my memory for a second. Are they doing this tournament all in one night where people are fighting a couple no, times, or are they doing no, this over doing, a period? Like, okay, every two months they'll be fighting. Okay. Yeah. So every, they're just doing this in preparation yeah. for the one event. But yeah, they do the one, but they'll be doing each time they do it, they're going to be doing this. Okay. okay. Yeah, it's not just this one. They'll be doing it every time. Because, like I said, if, say, they get it, they get, everyone gets to the semifinals of the tournament and somebody gets sick or hurt, they don't want to say, well, okay, you, you're coming as an alternate. Well, did you really earn it? You just you just got the luck of the draw that somebody got sick I or see what somebody saying, got yeah. hurt. And they're trying to, because of COVID, yeah, if somebody gets hurt, there's not much you can do about that. 
or if you get a cut in training or something like that. But or if you get cut so bad in a, in a fight that you can't, you know, you can't continue. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're, just, they're doing it to protect the integrity of the tournament. You know, uh, we had talked a little bit about Anthony off air um, and how he came to Rufus Sport and stuff like that. For a lot of people listening, they may not know Anthony. They may not know Anthony's story. How exactly did Anthony come to the gym and how did he start there? Anthony came in just as a regular student. I mean, he didn't come in to be a fighter. He came in just to be uh, learn a new martial arts. He was a Taekwondo background, and he wanted to do a different martial art. And he came in to be a better martial artist. But Duke recognized talent right away and said, "Hey, you should fight." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the kid, when you, you know, he's got that fire in him, and you know, he 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 uh, and he worked hard. So so when he came in. He had a background in Taekwondo and then transitioned into Muay Thai. Which, did he have any of a... Because he's a pretty accomplished jiu-jitsu player. Mm. Did he have any background in wrestling or jiu-jitsu? Or did no. he just pick that all up he at the gym? It, yeah, he just picked it up. I mean, and even before we had you know, high-level jiu-jitsu coach or anything else, Anthony would, was a sponge. He would watch film. He watched videos. And it was like, I remember Suju would tell me, yeah, he'd be... In a, I mean, he'd be practice throwing up the triangle on people. You know, he'd just be doing drills and that at the apartment just to get better. I mean, Anthony actually has more submissions than he does knockouts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was thinking about uh, um, that's something that Duke has said in the past yeah. that he's he's finished guys with submissions yeah. more than he's finished with them on his feet. I mean, he's got one of the best triangles, on, and it gets up there fast. Right? Yeah. Everyone's like, whoa. <laughs> well, yeah, he had that locked on Poyer, and then they ended up stopping yeah, that yeah. one fight because he had that bad cut, and then... Yeah. Bad stoppage. Yeah, bad, bad stoppage. Bad, bad time. <laughs> you wait when there's a break. When you got somebody deep in a triangle, you don't stop it then. That yeah. was just a bad call on the referee. But it's part of the fight game. Yeah. You know. Uh, you know how do you see him doing uh, over at, at PFL now? PFL, I mean, the biggest thing is um, PFL. It's, it's good. It's I, mean, I like a lot of the matchups. He's fighting Clay Collard the first round, who's mm -hmm. pre predominantly a boxer. He actually does pro boxing. But so we know one thing he's going to do, he's going to be stepping, mm -hmm. you know, he's going to try to come at Anthony, but you know, Anthony, the kicks are going to be you know, obviously there and Anthony's embracing uh, a lot more things. And as he gotten older, he's, he's realizing he can't always like uh, drive to the hoop like Michael Jordan did. Mm -hmm. What did Michael Jordan do when he got older? He developed a really good outside jump shot and, you know, fadeaway jump shot. So it's like, he didn't, you know, the physicality of doing some of that stuff, he can still do it. But he's finding other ways to win, you know. Is it an adjustment for for him at all taking elbows out of the game? One of the rules for PFL is you're not no, able to Anthony elbow. No, Anthony was never a big elbow elbow guy. Okay. Yeah, so really, that's not a big deal at all. Now, are knees part of it too? Is that there, or is that knee, taken out? I I'm not sure to be honest, hundred percent. Yeah, but I believe you can still throw knees to the head. Stand, okay. Obviously, standing, not on the ground. But, you know, it's like, that's why it's like, if you can throw a knee, I don't know why you can't throw an elbow. Yeah. They're, again, they're just trying to protect so that there's no cuts and there's no, uh, the, the, like I said, the integrity of the tournament. You know, we didn't talk about this beforehand, but it just, uh, we were talking about Sergio and it came up. He's fighting Archuleta for the mm -hmm. title. Uh, is that going to be in April as well? That's in May. That's in May? That's in May. That He's, uh, I don't know the exact date. But it's, I believe it's the middle of May. He's looking swall right now. I yeah. saw him at the gym the other day. Is it, now that's one thirty-five for him. Yeah, one thirty-five. He's just looking jacked. Well, he's he's like one probably one fifty-eight. He's know, that heavy well, right now. Yeah, well, he's ten weeks out. Yeah, so, you know, and, and he makes one thirty-five pretty easy. I mean, he used to make twenty-five, but everyone worries about how short he is or how that. It's like it doesn't matter i think he's just technical yeah, I, he, I i think he's just an amazing fighter in general yeah. i mean i'm also biased yeah <laughs> but well sergio is i don't think he's even he doesn't realize how good he is we talk about all the time i do kind of talk he's probably the most technical fighter striker we have on the team he's more technical than anthony anthony might be more dynamic but sergio can do all that stuff you know, and Sergio, I mean, Anthony and Sergio, even their demeanors are different. You know, they fight, I mean, like, oh, they're brothers. They do the same. No, they fight differently. Totally different styles. You know, yeah. so, but Sergio is a, he's a beast. He just had a pad session with Duke last week where, I, I mean, literally people in class were stopping to watch. He was that impressive on the pads. Yeah, he's he he's in he's coming into his own. He's only, what, 25? I was going to say 25 or 26. So, yeah, he, I mean, he, he's, he's young. 
you know so he's he's just coming into his own and he's a super nice kid he's you know he wants to win he likes to compete but he's not a mean guy at all no he's you super know, down to earth yeah. easy to talk to yeah answers so, questions from anyone he, he's just coming into his own yeah. as a, you know, not just as a, you know a fighter but as a person too i'm excited to see that fight yeah. i'm you know num- i'd said this to to duke before that i was really excited to see him in bellator i thought it was a good fit for him especially with the 125 division kind of being pushed out of the ufc i i saw i thought this would be a great home for him and him getting through archuleta and, and being a young champion i think will be a, a great great fit for him and oh, man just you know, honestly, just I want all the best for him. Yeah. Um, especially, you know, I had said the last time you and I had talked, I thought one of the coolest things was is that the fact that this is someone I've personally known since he was 16, 17 years yeah. old. And when you and Duke were gone, they were running pro practice. And I remember at one point, like I was leaving the gym and I stopped. And I was like, oh, I'm going to watch the, the pro guys train for a little bit. And you watch Anthony and Sergio and they're on the mats and, you know, they have all the other teammates around them and they're working on technical striking. And I'm like, I've watched this kid grow up since the time he was a teenager. Yeah. So now he's at the point where he's fighting for a championship in Bellator, and he's going over striking with that that kind of new class that we have in there right now. Mm-hmm. Guys like Christian Rodriguez, Brian Batista, um, Laura Sanchez, and they're going over this technical strike. And it was crazy for me to watch that kind of turn where he was watching him learn from guys like you, guys like Duke, and then now he's leading the charge of that new class that we have over at Rufus Sport. I mean, that's all Duke's thing wants, he wants to do. He wants these guys to be able to do their stuff and coach and know it. And, uh, it isn't, it's one thing to be able to do it, but understanding why you're doing it and when you're going to do it and breaking it down. A lot of, There's a lot of fighters that don't do that. They can do, but they don't know why. They, they're just physical, you know, guys. And it's like, Duke's, you know, trained him. We, you know, Duke's trained him so much that he will, we want all their our guys, our elite guys, should be able to walk onto a mat and be able to teach whatever we do. I mean, obviously, you're gonna put your own flair on it and everything, but it's it's all there for them to be able to do. Let me ask you a question: Do you feel it gives a guy like Sergio, a guy like Anthony, a guy like Manny, an advantage when they're fighting? that they're teaching as well, that they're coaching as well, that they're cornering as well. Like guys like Manny, the Pettis brothers, uh, Gerald, another one that comes to mind, Rafion, another one that comes to mind, guys that corner other fighters that are coaching, um, that coach wrestling, that coach jujitsu. Does this help their game when they're fighting as well? Every, it, it depends. It, I mean, it, but I, what I know about coaching when I first started coaching, I could do things. And then when, when somebody asks you, how did you do it? Well, how did you do that? You had to, I literally had to like, how did I do that? I had to like break it down and I had a, I had a better understanding in my head of how to do things. So technically I th- think coaching makes you better, mm-hmm. but I mean, it, what it doesn't do is like, you know, the, the mentality and everything else. You can, you can explain it. You can have that mentality or you don't have that mentality. And it's, that's one of the hardest things to do. You can teach them the skill you know the will that yeah the wanting to fight you know so but it does make you more i i believe it makes you more technical you know, like i said uh, people have asked me and i'm like how did i do it and i had to be able to break it down and how did i um, my how my own movements myself and what i was doing you know because you know, oh, oh just watch what i do that's a lot of people say that oh just watch you mm-hmm. know it's like some people can pick it up like that other people need a little bit more extensive explanation of how you did it, where each goes, where your hand goes, and everything else. And there is a reason why you do that because there's consequences when you don't. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of sense. I dig that. You know, we were talking about this this new class that we have at Rufus Sport um, as far as the new fighters that are coming up. Uh, we brought up a couple of names. One of them being Laura Sanchez. Um, a lot of people. Again, this is her. This is going to be her second professional fight. Mm-hmm. She's also in PFL. She's in the ladies' 155, or excuse me, the women's 155 tournament. Um, she came from, a, like, she came up in the Rupus Sport yeah, system. System. Yeah. Um, can Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Like, I know she has kind of a, ba- a, a background in basketball, but could you could you elaborate a little bit on how she got started I with think, Rupus Sport? Well, excuse me. 
Um, I think what she had to do, she played competitive basketball, you know, and she's in college, and I think she played some pro a little bit, and and not in uh, in the WNBA, but in a different leagues, you know, a lower level. Mm-hmm. But it's it just it wasn't going anywhere, and she just wanted another outlet, so she started kickboxing for herself, and it grew into that. You know, that's where a lot of our grassroots fighters are. We they start with us from kids. You know, younger, they started out, and we, they just developed into wanting to do it, compete. Mm-hmm. And uh, so she, uh, I think she just started doing it, and with not with, maybe not with the intention of fighting, but she started doing it, and it grew into it. And she's probably the least experienced fighter in the PFL in the tournament, but that doesn't mean anything, mm-hmm. in my opinion. If she can fight, you can fight, you can fight. It doesn't matter how well, she has, experience is. She also has a pretty... Um... Like she went out for the U.S. Is it the USA MMA? Am I, am I saying yeah, that correctly? Yeah, but she she's a amateur world champion in MMA. Mm-hmm. She went to uh, I believe it was in Japan mm-hmm. and won it. And then um, so and then she had a hard time getting fights, even as an amateur and everything. It's just because fight at 155 she was going down to 145 and it was actually just a hard cut to, for her to get down to 145 was hard mm-hmm. like she like I said she's six one and she probably walks around 170 and she in 175 and she's she's lean she you know so if for she can make 55 is you know is no problem but 45 was just, it was hard for her but she was doing it because she couldn't get fights any other way so it's she just has to uh the, 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 like I said, going back to what you said, uh, getting back to, uh, she just wanted to compete, and we got her into the, the fighting and a little bit more. And like I said, she just had a hard time getting fights. She was in, spends a lot of time in the gym. She just couldn't get fights going. Oh, sorry about that. I have people. No. My text messages. Is, I have my phone off right now, so <laughs> um, when I don't answer them, they go to my computer, and I got to figure out how to way to turn that off. I might have to turn that off. Uh, or dis, just disable it completely. So she's going to be fighting uh, Jenna Fabian? Am Fabian, I saying I Fabian? Fabian, yeah. Well, yeah very, uh, she's, she has a, uh, her background is kickboxing. She actually started with City Kickboxing in New Zealand. Oh, okay. And uh, where Israel is yeah. from. But now I believe she trains out in California with Kieran Fitzgibbons, who's a very good you know, Muay Thai coach. He's, his, uh, his, most of his success comes from actual Muay Thai and he's had lukewarm success with the MMA sometimes that understanding the crossover is is, is a little it's a learning curve mm-hmm. but uh, again he's a very solid coach and you know he's he's done really well in the striking aspect of like in regular uh, Muay Thai and everything but um, MMA she you know so Laura the girls obviously might be a little better striker than Laura and but at the same time, it's not a striking fight if Laura can, else can take her down and everything else. So the girl's only got three MMA fights. Mm-hmm. Her She just had fight experience, obviously, with kickboxing. But sometimes it doesn't always translate over. Yeah. Now, is this also, for the women's 155, is this also another million-dollar tournament, much yes. like the men's 155? Yeah. P- so she- PFL, that's all they do with the <clears throat> tournaments. They'll have a couple, well, like a warm-up fight, and then they'll go right into the tournament. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yeah, they do the tournament format all the time. Nice, nice. Um, we were, you know, I'm gonna expand a little bit more on what we would call the new class coming into Rufus Sport, uh, coming up in CFC or I'm sorry, CF FC. FC. There we Cage go. I keep Fury, Cage Fury Fighting Championships out in Philadelphia. Um, the the Philadelphia card has Brian Batista, one of the striking coaches over at um, uh, Rufus Sport, and also Christian Rodriguez, who is another. He's a featherweight. Yes. And yeah. Brian's a bantamweight. I believe so, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, how are they coming along? As I mean, as far as Christian goes, I've seen him. I've sparred with him. Uh, I think he's an amazing, amazing talent that we have coming up. There's actually, I've joked with him. I was like, hey, I'm like, when you get people to ball up like that and you get them up on the one leg and you take the back leg, I'm like, I stole that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. He, he's he's probably the, uh, one of, we have two other brothers that are coming up that were with us since they were like, not 10 8 and 11 i think mm-hmm. uh the flores brothers mm. yeah they're gonna be beasts one's only 17, 17. yeah i was just talking to him the other day yeah but um christian as of right now our current pros he's the last one that we brought up from you know from 
he was, I think he started with us at 15, 16 years old. So, I mean, he's, again, he's just been training, 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 fought amateur, and now he's four and all, four sloppy drews. And, I mean, he was just taking them up to, to the next level and, you know, getting tough fights. CFFC is a uh, East Coast, they, they have tough fights out there. I mean, that's, I believe that's where Paul Felder, Jared Gordon all came from out of that, you mm-hmm. know. So they're all tough, you know, got dudes and good fighters, both in the UFC. So Christian, you know, it's they're not going to be easy fights, but we believe in testing our guys young. You know, mm-hmm. it's like don't we're that we're have them fail at an early age and just get better than to be like first time you're in a hard fight is when you get up at that top level. Yeah. You know, so we'd rather test them early than to just you know give him easy fights until he gets to a certain point. Yeah, the complete opposite of boxing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but no, I'm I'm excited. You know, you brought up a good point. Um, I'm seeing, and, and it's it's hard for me at times to remember that he's an adult now. Because yeah. I'll look at Christian, I still look at him as the teenager yeah. that I used to see on the mats all the time. Yeah. And then all of a sudden I forget, I'm like, I'm like, hey, we're going to be, ho-, um, you know, I was telling him the other day, I was like, we're going to be doing the fights over at Brothers. And I was like, are, are you tw- are you 21 yet? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was actually going through some old pictures and we am going to toggle back to LaFleur's brothers. And I got pictures of them, like I said, in an 8 and 11 years old where I'm like squatting down in, you know, and they're like <laughs> these little kids. And it's like, holy cow, look at these guys. I literally, I've just known them for 11 years, watching them grow up in front of me. It's cool. Oh, you want to see? Uh, I wonder if I can pull this up really quick. I was going through Time Hop today and I was like, holy shit. I was like, oh, here it is. I wonder if I can put this on here. Here, I'll do a screen grab. Here we go. Screen mirror. We'll send this over to Beat Lab. Eight years ago no. today. Eight, no. <laughs> Eight. Wow. Pre beard. Oh, I had the baby beard. You had that baby face yeah. back then. Yeah. You and uh, Coach Lemke there. That's me. I, that's Eight years ago, getting years my ago. green belt. Well, I was fifty then. So I'm fifty-eight now. So <laughs> I'm, I'm old gray. I'm old and gray. Uh, yeah. Shout out to my little brother who produces this show. Randy, you seeing this over here? Yeah, I think I got it. <laughs> No, I, I no, I actually just wanted you to take a look at it. <laughs> That's me. Uh, eight years ago, we still had the mats when they're all the all the wall mats were still blue. Blue, yeah. The gym is yeah. People come in and the gym, Duke is always evolving to make the gym bigger and better. And yeah, it's insane what you know what you know what the gym is becoming. Oh, it's beautiful now. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've been with, I've been part of Rufus Sports since 1999, mm-hmm. and I've been teaching since 2000. So, how did you get started? I started uh, just as a regular student, mm-hmm. and uh, I was just taking regular classes. And actually, uh, Jason Strout, who is uh, he was just here. Yeah, he was just here. He uh, he coaches, you know, and he's been all over the place. He used to be part owner of Church Street Church Street Gym in New York, and uh, but uh, he was there, and then Duke was there. Uh, he was still fight. Duke was still fighting at the time. And I just started uh, taking classes, and then I was laid off from my job for a while. Mm -hmm. And so I'd come in during open, the gym was just open to use, and Duke would be teaching private lessons. I'd sit there, I'd watch him do a private, and then I'd go and try to practice the exact same thing on the bag. And I didn't watch what the the student did, I always just watched what Duke was showing. And I, um, so, and probably maybe a year into it, Duke asked, Jason was leaving, and Duke asked me if I was interested in teaching. And I'm like, um, I've only been doing this a year. <laughs> and he, he obviously felt out comfortable enough that I could, you know, and I was just teaching white belts. And he, like he said, just teach what you know. Don't try to teach what you don't know. And that's why I started with uh, uh, the white belts. And I just started building up. And I just, I, I just watch. I watch a lot. I watch Duke when he teaches. I watch... You know, if he brings his friends, uh, Giuseppe Del Natale up in Canada, he comes down and trains, and when they're training together, I just watch little things, and I was just, I'm lucky enough, I was just able to pick it up and understand everything. So I've been doing, I've been working with Duke for a long time. You know, on a more personal note, it's been amazing when you and Duke have been on the mats together. It's it's more so now with the advanced classes, but back in the day when you guys just did the, the normal, regular classes together, yeah. it was really neat to watch Duke be able to teach, he would teach a technique. And then I don't know if it's necessarily that there's stuff that he does that 
he doesn't realize that he's doing yeah, because you is. would step in yeah. and elaborate and you'd be like you see how you know he checks the kick he's not putting his foot down he's yeah. stepping out right away yeah. and it's these small steps that you take and i was like no shit that, i was like this is amazing well that's why i learned when i was when duke did i watch i'm a big footwork guy and moving their feet and where the hands are and everything else so i didn't watch what the actual a lot of people get caught up in watching the kick landing the punch landing i watched where his body's positioned everything i watched the other things the end result is the kick landing and the punch landing but what did you do to get it there and I watch that a lot, and I still do to this day. I'm, I'm a big, I watch people shadow box. I watch their habits, because the habits start from the moment you get in your stance. Mm-hmm. And I was that's where I was able to pick a lot of stuff up, because I, I didn't know it, but I, I didn't understand a lot of back when I first started. But when I watched, I literally just copied, you know, what he did, and I then I figured out little things on my own, what worked for me, and what, you know, other things I could and couldn't do. You know, you brought up a good point about footwork. I was talking about this with uh, my girlfriend last night, and I was like, you know, we're talking about style bender in that first and second round where you see his feet and how he was moving, where he was, you know, he's stepping between the legs and he's stepping outside the legs, and then he's like, he's constantly switching his stance. It was such a really interesting thing to watch on how someone who I consider one of the highest level strikers in the UFC. And how his footwork actually works, and how he's setting these things up, and how his feints work, um, it was just crazy to watch. He, when you brought the footwork up, it, it, I was sitting no. there thinking about that from last night, where where Callie and I were talking about that. You know, a, a real elite striker that has that type of footwork. Now, is that something that's real common for people that operate at that level? A guy like Stylebender, a guy like Duke, uh, you know, guys that that are traditional strikers that have that type of footwork. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, because well, if you go to any, if you watch any um, good, like, say we go boxing, you, we, we're a big proponent of Cuban-Russian style boxing. If they all got great footwork, you never see them plodding heavy on their feet, they're light on their feet and everything. And so and you, we cherry pick what we feel is work. We don't say we're always going to do this, we're always going to do that, but we're able to take certain things that, that's going to work. But the footwork is isn't just going to help your striking, but it's also going to help your defense. You know, someone like um, Tiago Santos, mm-hmm. he was he's a big, powerful guy, but every, when you see him rush in in his fight, how, how off balance he was. He was off balance a lot. Yeah. And if you get hit at that time when you're not set, you can't absorb. You know, that's what I mean. Is, uh, Israel is like with his feet. He's able to take punishment because his feet are underneath him. And when he leans, he actually is rolling with the punch. He doesn't just, a lot of guys will brace where he'll get hit and he goes with it. And he doesn't, that's one of the reasons why he doesn't take as much damage. You know, but you got to have your feet underneath you and, you know, a lot of little small details that people don't take for granted. And I think a lot of coaches, their fundamentals aren't, they get caught up in what fighters can do, not Mm -hmm. what they can't do. Like when Duke and I watch all the fighters, we look, we yeah, we appreciate the striking, but we also look at, we reverse engineer it. How do you beat it? How do you know? What, how do you? How would I beat it? How what would I do? Everything else. What would I'm looking for to take advantage of those things? And if they're feeding on in, in the right spot, it's easier to 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 beat. Makes a lot of sense. Um, I'm thinking of someone like myself who's a little bit heavier, <laughs> who doesn't have. That type of, of wherewithal. Do you teach different footwork for like someone who's heavier, like a heavyweight, like when you guys had like Rothwell? Um, what was the other one that I had coming to mind um, for heavier guys, or is it just kind of? No, it should be the same. Obviously, the, same. the smaller guys can do. Obviously, there's certain things smaller guys can do. They're looking to be a little quicker and everything. But we always tell guys, um, bigger guys, try to if you're big and you're strong, don't plant your feet. Get mobile. Try to fight like a small guy and have a button, then have power at the same time. Mm-hmm. You know, because you want to be mobile. I, I've always said, if, if I'm only worried about a big guy when he's standing in front of me. If I can move and be off to the side and everything in and then over, I mean, it's it's not as dangerous. But if a big guy that can move his feet well, mm-hmm. they're scary. <laughs> Some be hitting the jump yeah. rope on Monday. <laughs> yeah, big guys that can move their feet are scary. Yeah. You know, um, not such a big guy, um, welterweight division, uh, former, a former 
uh, athlete that used to train with us, uh, Bilal Muhammad, is going to be fighting Leon Edwards in the upcoming, uh, I believe this is next week Saturday already. Yeah, that's yep, next week Saturday already. Yeah. Oh, it's the March 7th already. Jesus. Yeah. Um, Bilal's going to be fighting Leon Edwards. Uh, Leon Edwards coming off a long, well, it, it wasn't necessarily he was injured or anything like that right before Just lockdown. Just because of COVID and everything. Yeah, COVID. And in England was locked down where they couldn't travel and everything. Yeah. And, but um, I believe uh, Tyron actually one time was supposed to fight him. Yeah, right before and, yeah, lockdown yeah, in, in England. Just, yeah, it fell through. But, yeah, good, big step up for Bilal. But Bilal is, you know, he's a beast too. He's a guy that's got to tank that, you know, the pressure and everything else. He looks so great in his last yeah. fight. The one thing I hope he does, he's, he's got to have a little bit of pop. You know, mm-hmm. if he, he's got to, like, pop and crack these guys. If he can crack a little bit once in a while, mix in that speed, and then crack every once in a while to keep them off balance there, I mean, that's going to be, you know, that would be, I think, the key. Because if, if you get a – because there was one thing at the 170, the top guys, they can all crack. Yeah. I mean, you saw that in Gilbert Burns and uh, Usman fight. Those two were swinging. Yeah. They were yeah. hitting. And, and Usman's got a tank. You know, gas tank too. He don't get tired, and he he can throw. He's throwing just as hard in the fifth round as he is in the first round, and that's hard to do. And that's crazy because you look at the the top five in that division. You look at a guy like Covington. You look at a guy like um, I was gonna say Woodley, um, Usman. You look at a guy like Usman. You look at a guy like Covington, um, Burns, all, Burns, Burns yeah. all those guys. Deep gas yeah. tanks all can go. I mean, and it's it's so weird to be able to say that. You know, Burns got put down by Usman like that, but at the same time, it's one of those that the adjustments that Usman has made since he's been champion has been crazy. He was yeah. popping that jab like yeah. a goddamn piston. Yeah, that's one. Well, he looked really fucking good. Yeah, um, I, I, I think uh, Burns did what Al Jermaine did. He went out too fast, too early. Yeah, he hurt him in the first, but he just wasn't there. You know, Usman, I mean, Usman obviously shows wore his toughness. It, yeah, or well. You know, and he, he went to another camp, you know, for this fight because you know, his coach didn't want to say, hey, no bad blood. He just stepped away, Henry Hoof. And then, but um, he went in and worked with Trevor Whitman, who just really cleaned up his hands a little bit. You could see the difference between that fight and his fight with Colby. His, yeah. his jab alone was a dangerous weapon. And I've said it for years. I think the jab is, I mean, it gets thrown, but it doesn't get thrown enough. You know, a good jab. George St. Pierre, who literally just literally broke Josh, Josh Koscheck's face with a jab. Mm-hmm. You know, so it's like it doesn't get used enough. And if, when you use it, they're in it. You get good with it. It 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 can deter, it can change the fight. You know, even though Koscheck changed camps, uh, he was trained with. I believe he was trained with the AKA for a while there. He had changed camps. He was not the same fighter after that, that GSP fight. It just. Yeah. I don't know if something broke with well, him or or, taking, or what. Taking beatings, you know, it can make you mentally. You just don't know, and it's like you never know how you buy. Imagine getting a car crash. You know, how are you gonna feel for a while after a car crash? Yeah, can't you get know, behind so, you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like that's basically what they're doing. They're taking enough punishment that they're they're in a car crash. Yeah, you know, some of these fights out of wars, and they take punishment. You know, it's no joke. Oh man, even holding pads and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. I we've we've talked about it off air about like you you were having like some some chest pain and they're like w- was he in a car accident no yeah. you know he holds pads for professional fighters yeah, yeah. <laughs> i mean I'm, I'm lucky enough now it's like we're at a point where i don't have to do a lot of the heavy lifting with the mm-hmm. pads duke duke is a few years younger than me he, I'm, he's just turned 50 or 51 and i'm 58 now and i, I just these young guys i just i just can't handle it no more i mean i can do it but then i'm just beat up you know, and yeah, it's like I just have to hold some punch mitts for him and everything. Now I don't have to hold, pick up the tie pads, and I still, I mean, my knowledge and helping him on the bags and everything else, pointing things out is what I'm doing. So I'm still obviously still coaching him, but I don't, I don't have to do the heavy lifting on the pads. Well, you know, even you know when I when I've been in boxing from a from a personal perspective, you'll come over and be like, Parker, loosen the fuck up, because like I, I have this bad habit where, um, it's. I'm I'm used to just being like mm, I'm gonna muscle this yeah. out. And you're like just relax, brother, just relax. But I mean, I think you have a great eye for that. Where it's where it's I mean, you can you can hold pads for people. Anyone can hold a pad. Um, some people do it better than other others. But I think the fact that you're able to just pick stuff out and you're able to watch from the outside 
and be able to be like, hey, 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 do yeah. this, do this, do this. Do you feel like that's a little bit better of a role as, or I should say, a little bit easier to be able to spot these things? Oh, yeah. I rather mean, than when you're holding. Well, that's why, I mean, like when I'm teaching, I can't see as much. You know, uh, like I, I'd say go back to your class. We talked that advanced class. Duke is running the class. I'm on the mat also. But I'm, I'll, I watch Duke. You know, and I'm, you know, I've, I've been around him, like I said, for 20 years. I've helped him. I've held pads for him for his last three or four fights. Mm -hmm. So I, I know, I know what to look for. I know all these things. And I point things out to people. And I just said, well, watch what he, don't watch his strike, watch his feet, watch what he's doing with his hands, these little details and that. And that's where I think I, I, I can come into play. I'm, I'm all like, I can, I can point out the small things, the small adjustments, because sometimes being advanced isn't being that flashy. It's doing the little things that makes the smallest difference. And those small muscle movements are sometimes harder to do in a big muscle movement. You know, it, it's a little more detail there. It's a little more body control to do these things. And that's, I mean, I think that's what I'm picking up, especially with the fighters. You know? And then the mentality. I, I'm, I, I'm not a mean guy, but... And I get somebody. I'm, I I I I call it fighting like an old man. I'm gonna I'm gonna do as much damage as possible with the least amount of effort. And <laughs> I can, I know how to hurt hurt. Yeah. <laughs> and I show people that you know it's like sometimes it's not even on the ground. I'm not a jits guy, but there's certain things on the ground that you do. It's just, it's fighting. It's not jujitsu. It's not a grappling tournament. It's not a you know a boxing match or kickboxing. It's fighting. So there's things that you can do within the rules. There's a lot of things that people don't do. You know, and I'm like just being, I mean, it's not being a dick, but you, you can be in mean, you know, yeah. and it's like, you gotta be, you gotta want, unfortunately to fight, you gotta be willing to hurt somebody. And that's, that's not, that's not normal. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's not, and it's to be able to flip the switch and say, I'm going to go hurt this dude. And then you walk, Hey, what's up? How you doing? Have, you know, have a, all smile and having a good conversation. It's not a normal thing. Yeah. You know, and to teach somebody these small little things. And, I mean, I, that's where I think I do well at. You know, you brought up a good point, drilling the small things. You know, we've talked about this off air. Uh, one of the guys being Paul Felder. Um, I, remember, I remember hearing a story about the fact that when he came in, he thought he was going to learn all this flashy stuff. And instead, he was, like, surprised that he was being drilled on the most basic stuff. You know, yeah, we just cleaned them up. We didn't try to change them. We didn't try to do anything. But we just cleaned them up, you know, and it's just like he, he went on, he came to us off of a loss and look, I mean, what he's done, you know, he's, he went on a pretty good run with us, you know, and obviously Duke did most of the heavy lifting with him, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I was always, you know, working with him on pads and, you know, and everything and he, uh, and just pointing things out and just breaking things down on how you do this, why did you do this and everything else. And he was just like, oh, it's so much easier when I do it this way. And I'm like. It's not, you know, some of the stuff isn't, it's not hard. It's mm -hmm. just doing it the right way. Yeah. I, you know, as, as far as like someone I, I've seen come into the gym and, and go through the system, that's someone I'm, I'm really happy to see that, that gained a lot of success. Um, number one, training under the gym. And then number two, becoming who I think is one of the standout commentators for oh, the UFC. Yeah. I think he just won an award, didn't he, with, for uh, commentating? I thought that was last year. Yeah, yeah. this was like within but, the last couple yeah. months. They yeah. won uh, Analyst of the Year yeah. uh, through, I think it was Fighting Magazine. I mean, I don't know if he's going to fight again. He, he's making, you know, good money doing that. I mean, yeah, I know the UFC like him, likes him a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, he went to school for acting, college and that. So, you know, he, he's, you know he, he's an actor. And he actually, I think he just did a little TV show. He did a, had a part and everything. So he's looking to do stuff like that. And it's like, if, I know he's got that itch of, competing he, he's one of the toughest dudes i've ever met he fought you know, with a broken arm against mike perry yeah and it only lost a split decision yeah he broke it in the first round yeah throwing the spinning <laughs> back fist and he was this fool was still throwing it yeah <laughs> later in the fight you know the, i you know, there's a lot of stories i have about him number one we saw him fight at some barbosa in chicago yeah. he was eating those kicks from him and then they were just going back and forth with that spin fest yeah. and you and i had talked about talked about after that fight you know there was maybe one or two things he could have done differently and he would have won that fight. Um, even then, even back then, you saw it with him that he had that potential of being a really good fighter. It was just one or two things that were missing. Um, and then on a more personal note, uh, you had said you had talked about acting. One of the really cool things I remember I remember seeing was I was like, he had come to our gym and you just started training with us. And 
Dan Gonzalez had introduced me to him and he was like, hey, Parker, you know, you know, Paul has these questions about maybe writing some music for him for his next fight. Uh, I think he was fighting in Scotland. I think that was his first fight uh, they had. Yeah. Um, and he, he had basically described what he wanted and I, I eventually wrote it for him. And I remember like I written it, sent it off to him. I was like, hey, does this work? And I sent it to whoever at the UFC. And I was telling Dan Hicks about this at McGillicuddy's. And I was like, yeah, I, I wrote this music for him. Really nice guy. I, I saw him fight in Chicago. So on and so forth. I look up at the TV and he's on Always Sunny in Philadelphia mm. with that Crow's Milk episode. <laughs> and it was uh, it was him and someone else. And I remember seeing I was like, oh, no shit. I was like, that's the guy I just wrote music for. I was like, he's in Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It's completely crazy. Um, I'm excited to see what happens for him, whether or not he continues to stay competing, whether he pursues acting. I think him being in the UFC and being a, an amazing commentator um, opens up even more doors for him for acting. Yeah. And just an all-around great guy and yeah. fun guy to hang out with, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, he's, yeah, Paul's just a straight-up, you know, good, good dude. I mean, he fit, you know, a lot of guys don't always fit into a gym right mm -hmm. away, but he fit in real simple. He just came in and he worked hard and he listened. He didn't come in with, a, hey, I'm a UFC fighter. He was... He wasn't he wasn't too big to be shown how to fix some things yeah. you know it's like like so we didn't change them we just cleaned some things up yeah you know so it was he's, he's a great guy hopefully i'll see him this week when i go out to philly on tuesday I'll oh that's see, right yeah. he lives out there yeah he's out there cm punk's gonna be commentating so shout out to cm yeah, punk yeah cm yeah he's got a, yeah i i talked to punk before lockdown he had a lot going on i know he locked up that deal with fs1 he was doing the the backstage WWE show, yeah. and then I think at one point when he first got that deal, he was I was like I was like oh so how's that working out? He's like uh, he's like I get to be a sideline analyst for the Chicago Bears. And I was yeah. like, are you fucking serious, bro? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just I was happy to hear that like everything was really coming together yeah. for him. And then he was doing the the CFFC as well and, yeah. and doing the commentating as well. I mean, I, I knew Punk when he first came to the gym. I knew he was uh, the WWE, and I, I mean, a pro wrestler. And I didn't really didn't know. I didn't I used to watch it back in the day with you know a long time ago. But you know, I didn't never never. I could honestly say I've never seen Punk wrestle. Yeah. And I actually looked him up, and I was like, holy shit! You know that he was literally the longest reigning WWE champion in history. Yeah. You know, longer than Hulk Hogan and all these other huge names that people know about. And I didn't. You don't realize how big a name he is until you're around them with other people and they're like shell-shocked and it's like he's the most down-to-earth guy you know simple you know he's just a, he's another guy he's great great guy all that stuff doesn't mean nothing it's what he did yeah it's not who he is you know that was uh that was one of the the text the first text messages i got um i forgot what card it was i actually i think it was the gilbert mendez anthony pettis card uh hendrix was on that card too it was out in Vegas, and I remember getting the text message after the announcement that Punk was going into the UFC. Uh, my roommate at the time, Lee Gook, had texted me, and he goes, he goes, dude, he's like, CM Punk just joined the UFC, so on and so forth. And I was like, yeah, he's going to be training with us, too. And he goes, what? Yeah. <laughs> and that was that was kind of the push that actually got Lee to come train with us. He was like, oh, no shit. He's like, Punk's going to be training there? And he's like, well, I definitely want to try this. Well, it's a crazy side note is that when that fight we're talking about we saw paul and uh paul Pelder fight barbosa in chicago yeah. we got those tickets from punk was was oh that's we right we did yeah i remember <laughs> punk goes oh yeah i got a couple extra tickets you want to go and i'm like yeah sure i asked you to go and we went down there i remember we're all, all the way up the top like hey where's my where's our seats it's like oh they're down there we're down the next level hey where's our seats kept going down next thing you know we're literally one row behind uh dana white and cm punk on, yeah. on the floor inside the thing we're like ah oh, pretty cool <laughs> i was uh i was i was a kid in candy store i had met andre arlovsky that day um i met um your 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 crush yeah <laughs> felice herring felice herring yeah. um we met her in passing when we were leaving and I, like i was so focused i was like we were getting out of there i i'd had a few drinks and i was like i wanted to go to illuminati's and grab some pizza and you're like parker 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 your girlfriend i went what i look over i see felice i was like hey yeah. well I, I i said i know felice from working on i uh, did uh, season 20 of ultimate fighter and got to know her so I was like, when you saw, you know, she's got goes those fights and yeah. And I don't know if I get, I already knew her. if I saw her, I'd be able to introduce yeah. her to you. Yeah. I was, it, it was crazy down there. I, I, we had, 
Mario Lopez, who was sitting like one row up and like one row over from us. And I was like, Kush, Kush, as AC Slater over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was honestly, that was, that was a crazy, crazy good time. Um, you know, again, big shout out to CM Punk. He got us those tickets. He got us the tickets to uh, the last Chicago card yeah. that we went yeah. to. Um, where we actually, we, the Jessica I, uh, Valentina Shepchenko fight. Um, yeah, you, big shout out to him. Shout out to Paul. I can't remember if it was Paul or, or Punk that got us those tickets. Maybe it was both. Uh, I think it was Punk. Yeah. Yeah, in Chicago. Punk, yeah. Punk is huge. I mean, he's obviously, he's a huge uh, Chicago Cubs and, and a Blackhawks fan and everything. And so it's like, it's cool that I see he gets to do stuff, you know. Yeah. yeah. Actually, you know, now that I think about that, it was it was me Dan Gonzalez, Chicago Nick, who would come up this past weekend at, to watch the fights, and uh, I think uh, Paul Felder. We were watching the under undercard at the hotel, and Punk was texting Paul and Dan, and like, "Hey, where are you guys?" We're like, "Oh, we're at the hotel." Parker's got his iPad out. We're we're watching the fights, whatever. And he's like, "Cool." He's like, "I'll come down there and pick you guys up." And then all of a sudden, Nick gets there, and he's like, "All right, guys, let's go." And Punk's outside <laughs> waiting for us. We hopped in. He's like. He's like, oh, he's like, I've been here a bunch of times as we're driving up to the United Center. He's like, I can go park in the back over here. He's like, I still got a pass back there. <laughs> he's like, hey, he's like, so we have to go in this way because we're with the UFC. He's like, not to be a dick, you guys have to go all the way around to the front to go get your tickets and then walk in and stuff like that. But it was it was quite an experience. So all of a sudden, be like, do we order an Uber? No, we ordered a, we ordered Punk to pick us up. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's he's yeah. no, he's a great guy, yeah. man. Yeah. And and to be honest, like, going back again, uh, nothing but great things happened for him. He's got the comic book that he did, yeah. uh, the deal with FS1, uh, the deal with CFFC, um, doing commentating as well, and just a great dude to train with. Uh, yeah, talking to Punk, it was like we, we were talking, and you know his friend uh, Dave Bautista who's in does movies now, and yeah, everything. and he said that he goes, yeah, I remember we're having a conversation on a plane ride going somewhere to, for a match, and. You know, we're soccer and where Dave Bautista's like, Oh yeah, I'm gonna I wanna be doing movies and Punk's like, Yeah, I wanna have my own comic book and print and print and all and doing all this stuff and a lot of the guys thought like, Oh pff, you're not gonna do that and look at them now, they're both, you know, Dave Bautista is doing doing quite a very, quite well in movies and yeah. Punk is doing the kind of his comic book plus he's doing other stuff, you know. So he's he's doing quite well for himself outside of uh the wrestling. Did you uh did you ever catch any of Bautista's um uh, MMA fights that you did? Uh, I've never seen a full fight. I've seen clips. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's really it's pretty hard to tell. He's a big dude, yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the biggest, I mean, it's like Punk came into it. I mean, mad props for Punk to even want to do it. I mean, he came in, he, he was a pro wrestler, but he didn't come in like a lot of those guys have uh, experienced college wrestling and stuff like that. Punk never had that. And he mm -hmm. came in, you know, just green and learning it at, you know, mid-30s. And to go in and competing, so it's like you know what people can say what they want, but most people don't have the balls to do what he did, you know. And his body was kind of beat up from you know wrestling, so he had some injuries that he was off for and everything else that people don't realize, you know. So, but mad props for what he yeah. to even attempt doing. I mean, most people like you know they they want you know the keyboard warriors will say what they want, but mad props for what he want. Yeah, you know. And I mean, it was, he did a really good. He really a really good job in class. I worked with him a couple of times, uh, holding pads with him, doing drill work, um, rolling with him. And it was one of those I knew he was cutting down from, I think he was around like 205, 210, somewhere around there. And he was getting smaller and smaller the more and more he was training with us. But I don't think a lot of people realized how just naturally strong he is. He yeah. doesn't look, he doesn't look yeah. like a, an average fighter, but you put your hands on him and you start rolling and you're like, you're fucking solid bro yeah and um, what, he's 38 now 39 maybe yeah yeah he's yeah so i mean he's not you know i make <laughs> I'm, i like to say that's not old anymore but it when you go when you to do that to get that age you first start in the ufc yeah with no other you know martial arts background that's pretty impressive yeah um i really wanted to see him to, to do really well but um yeah, it, it didn't work out for him, but like I said, he's got a lot of other great things going for him, and yeah. and he's able to do the things that he really loves. I, I, I feel that he's found a love for commentating, yeah. um, doing the behind-the-scenes work, not necessarily working for the WWE, but being able to do commentary for it 
and then being able to, like I said, you know, where he'll get an assignment from FS1, be like, yeah, you gotta go cover this, so yeah. and so forth, or cover yeah. stuff for for Fox Sports. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're we're pretty lucky. We've gotten it. I mean, the, the guy, the people that come through the gym. I remember the first uh, we got involved in uh, the UFC is through Stephen Bonner. He came in up from Chicago on a Saturday morning, just on his own. No mm-hmm. one asked him to. He just came up on his own. Where I had to literally call Duke and said, "Yo, Duke, you might want to come down." <laughs> 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 and that's how it is, you, know, you know. So it's like that's got him. You know, that's how we got started. You know, with Stephen. Stephen just stepped in and you know to do some different training with Duke. And that's where was where was Stephen Bonner training at in Chicago? Yeah, I think you believe it was a Carlson Gracie Senior. Okay. Yeah, and out of those guys. And, that's uh, what I thought. Yeah. So. I don't know the gym he was training at, but I know he was training with Carson Gracie Sr. and everything. And uh, so he, uh, but yeah, he he's out in Vegas now. But yeah, Duke trained him for the last few fights. But he's another another guy, solid, great guy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've been lucky to have get to meet a lot of people and, you know, a lot of fighters come through the doors. And like, I used to train Joe Prisbiller from the, from the NBA. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, I trained him, you know, for in, well, in the off season. Great guy, and I was actually supposed to go train Yao Ming in uh, China. I was gonna go over there, and no they're gonna shit. put me up and everything, and they're gonna like pay me to be over there and train him because they're so impressed with uh, what I did with Joel with his footwork and everything. And uh, but Yao Ming bl- hurt his knee right at the end of the season, and where obviously he had to get surgery and just rehab. Mm-hmm. But that would have been a cool experience. Yeah, being a, being yeah. able to go over a track. Yeah, I gotta ask this though: How the hell do you hold pads for someone who's seven foot seven one? I, well, I can't remember what he was ringing in at. Well, Joel, Joel, I was going up on my tiptoes. <laughs> yeah, I was going up. Wah, wah, catch. I mean, I I had a chest protector once. I let him teep me once to the chest, and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Joel's only I mean seven foot with uh, like. 240 pounds but and with that leverage of that leg going out there and i'm like yeah this ain't happening <laughs> <laughs> but i mean a lot of him i did a lot with i did a lot of footwork stuff with him and conditioning we used to do a thing where we uh we go on the basketball you got to pump that basketball which is pretty hard doesn't you know not very soft and you just roll on your abs and you're just like doing a superman on you just have your fingers and toes on the mat on the floor and you just roll on the basketball and Punk, first time he did it, Punk was, I mean, sorry, Punk, but Joel was like going, oh, 30 seconds, that's all he could do. And I got him, we got doing it like three, four minutes at a time. And he said, he went into the in, uh, in the camp and he was making bets with these guys that, oh, you know, they would do this and that. And they're like, oh, that ain't nothing. And he goes, hey, I made them bet. He had bet money that they couldn't do it for a minute. And he goes, I was just making money off of these guys. Because <laughs> they're like, fuck that shit. <laughs> Because your whole time, you had, your gut, you had to tighten your abs. Yeah. It's a lot harder than it looks. Ah, yeah. Um, you know, moving on to a, a couple other fights I want to get to, and, and we'll kind of wrap this up. Uh, Jordan Griffin uh, going back onto the mats April 10th. Uh, Louis Saldana. Yeah, yeah, Saldana. Both, uh, both are content, uh, Dana White contender series. series. Yeah, both alumni there. Tough fight, long dude. Jordan... Jordan's, uh, you know, he's a guy that, and he just, when he's on, he's a beast. He's just got to put it together a little bit more. But so hopefully he can take a, uh, get a win out of that one. And then uh, Gerald's going to be fighting the, I think the following week or the following he's the 17th, the April following, 17th. Yep, a week later. Yeah. Um, wait, are those all happening at the Apex still? Yes, yeah. So are you just going to stay out there the whole time with no, both of them? Or no, are you gonna I'm going to be coming back and I'm going to come back. It's hard to, because hopefully, I, I mean, I think the UFC is loosening up there uh, where you don't have to be out there. It's Usually it's Tuesday you'd have to be out there and stay under quarantine or really strict. And I think they loosened it up a little bit where the corners can come on Thursday. And oh, okay. then I get tested as long as I'm clean, you know, you know, test clean, you know, positive or negative, I should say, yeah. that... Um, I can that would work, so it would make it easier. So I just go out to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, come home, be at home for a few days, cause I got a crazy tra- Duke and I have some crazy uh, traveling schedules coming up with the PFL having to be out in Atlantic City for two weeks. Are you both gonna be out there for that? Uh, Duke's going out for Anthony. I'm gonna be out there for Laura. Laura. So okay. we're different. We just there's only two of us now, you know. So it's like it's just tough for us all to be there. I'm literally going. I go next week, um, and. 
I go Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to Philadelphia. I come home Friday. Uh, I think I'm home the next week. Then the week after that, I'm going to be in Connecticut with Manny. Uh, the following week, I'm going to be in Vegas with Jordan. The following week after that, I'll be in Vegas with Gerald. And then right after that, I go to Atlantic City for 17 days. Now, with, with all these fights coming up now, there's been kind of a restructuring at the gym. Are you taking different people with you now like are you taking gerald with you to go over the jujitsu side of things or is like lovato coming out there now like how exactly is that working this, uh, is, this is mostly just a personal curiosity yeah no um gerald is just doing the you know a lot of the jits and everything he's a you know very good black belt and um he's literally he's tied with three people two other people in the ufc for the most submissions in middleweight division so if he gets a submission he'll actually have you know the most submissions in middleweight history in the ufc mm -hmm. which is pretty cool yeah yeah you, know, <laughs> you know when you're thinking about it so uh so that's a big that's big well he's got he's got some jujitsu yeah. royalty with him there there's jacques ray Souza, yeah um damian maya who have had, yeah. had some of the the most yeah. submissions in that division so Wait, yeah I'm, well, oh, I'm sorry. Sosa's, Sosa's yeah, middleweight. Crazy. Yeah, he's at 85. Oh, he is? Okay. Yeah, yeah, he's an 85-er. But, sorry, um, with no notes in front of me, I'm yeah, literally just no. pulling this up. I'm like, yeah, he's an 85-er. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. I had to think about who he was fighting there for a second. <laughs> but no, he, uh, yeah, Gerald had a couple uh, rough runs his last couple fights. But, I mean, he's, he, you know, he looks great in the gym. And, you know, he's got a really good matchup. He's a fucking beast, man. Yeah, he's, uh, I mean... I don't think again he's another guy even though he's got a lot of experience i mean and he's he just if he could understand how good he really is you know I mean, a lot of it, his is mental yeah if anything else it's not i mean he's got the skill set he's so, i mean every time i've seen him on the mats with with sparring and training he's a fucking animal yeah uh, he, and, and, you know you see how he's hitting the bags you see how he's sparring with people i mean even though he's even going 25 percent, he's just steps ahead of everyone if that makes yeah. sense no no it is he's good he's really i mean he's he's been fighting gerald never had an amateur fight he turned pro at 18 and that was back when wisconsin didn't have a commission where soccer kicks were legal like pro old pride rules. i was gonna say was yeah. like old pride yeah. rules yeah. so he that's what he fought you know he that's all he knew mm -hmm. so i mean he's got 34 wins 23 submissions <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah, you know, and he's fought. You know, and that's and again, it's it's he's evolved though too. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's he's another guy. You know, he just didn't like. Oh, I have all this experience. He's still learning and getting better too. I yeah. mean, he's still thirty three years old, and he's got fifty fights. Yeah, if not more, fifty. So, <laughs> well, starting at eighteen, yeah, you you pick up a yeah. kind of a record along the way. Yeah, man, I think I actually covered everything. I don't think I left anything out this time. Oh, you know what I want to close on? I want to close on this uh, UFC 260. We had talked about this a little bit off air um, with the Stipe Miocic, uh, Francis Nugano. These guys are meeting for a second time. One, not even a month from now. I think three weeks from now. Yeah, three weeks from now. Um, by the way, shout out if you want to catch these fights, you can catch them over at Brothers. Uh, I'll be hosting them over there. And of course, uh, COVID restrictions. I'm assuming are still in place. Uh, the overflow will go over to Uncle Bucks. You can go catch them over there. Um, they have two floors that they have dedicated to that and it's absolutely fucking beautiful that rooftop that they have over there the old the old uglies um what else was that i think that was the that wasn't cafe vecchio what else was that that was something else too back in the day oh, honestly i don't remember they, they switched so much I yeah <laughs> Uh, my mind, my mind's going. I'm getting old. I feel like <laughs> such an old man these days when I, I I have conversations with other people in the service industry, and they're like, "Well, we're going to like, for example, we're going to Red, White, and Blue." I was like, "Oh, the old bar, Milwaukee," and they're like, "What?" Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I've talked to people when they talk about well, back in the day. I said, "Oh, you should go ever go to Cushion North Avenue," and they're like, "No, I heard about it." I'm like, "Yeah, you don't have a back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> Your back in the day was on junior high." <laughs> I feel so old at times where, like, I have conversations with, with people in the industry. A big shout out to uh, the, the, the servers over at Taylor's, but you fucking kids make me feel old as shit. <laughs> where I was like, yeah, back in, like, you know, 2005, and I, I would say something. They're like, I was in elementary school at the time, and I was yeah. like, this conversation's fucking over. <laughs> I, 
my I know I'm getting old when I'm talking to people and they're like, oh, my dad's a, oh, he's in his 50s. And I'm like, I'm probably older than your dad. No, he's like 54. And I'm like, yeah, I'm older than your dad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's rough. Oh, you know what? I'm, I'm sorry. Circling oh, back right. to, to what I was saying, Stipe, uh, Stipe and Francis Nuganu. Um, do you see this going any other way? You know, the first time around, Stipe, um, to, to explain for people that, that don't know this fight all that well, uh, Francis Nuganu is this wrecking ball. He has an, an um, he has just unbelievable fucking power that he has. That if he touches you, he will put you to fucking sleep. And he's done it before. Uh, it wasn't Andre Arlovsky. It was uh, no, he, Alistair Overeem, oh, yeah. whose head he snapped. He hit yeah, him with a, a rear uppercut. uppercut. He lifted him off his feet. Lifted him off his feet and snapped his head back. And it was top five, one of the nastiest yeah. fucking knockouts I'd ever seen in my life. Um, he has scary power. Stipe Miocic, uh, collegiate uh, college wrestler, firefighter on top of that. So he's firefighter tough. And on top of that, he's just an amazing fighter. One of the, uh, when he fought DC again, really put it together with his strike and to be able to put him yeah. down. Do you see this going kind of the same way? Stipe trying to wrestle him and finish would, him that way, uh, even though it's in a smaller cage at the apex? Yeah, I would say you have to. I mean, it's like you don't want to stand there. and w- Why risk it? I mean, Nagano is, you know, again, you said, you know, one of the top knockout fighters in the, the US, heavyweight division. Yeah, in heavyweight division. And it's like, why would you why would you stand there and bang with them? Don't beat them what they do best. Beat them what they don't do, what they do worst. If, so if he's weak on the ground, you put him on the ground. You know, it's not a boxing fight. It's not kickboxing. It's an MMA fight. Mm-hmm. It's mixed martial arts. And ground game is a big part of it. If you don't want to lose on the ground, get better on the ground. <laughs> you know, I'm, so. I'm hoping to see that he's gotten some better takedown defense because I want actually want to see those guys sit and bang. Yeah. Um, but I mean, Stipe is actually though he's makes for the last DC fight you saw he came in a lot lighter. Well, yeah, I think yeah. he was expecting yeah. to go yeah. that that fight and to go a lot longer. Not only that, but his, it made his mobility a little better, you know, and he made him a little quicker. And I don't think he needs a he might not come in quite so light against. Uh, Nagano, but I don't think he's going to get back up as heavy. I mean, because Stipe is a big dude. I mean, was, we've been down at his gym training before, and there's a picture, and it's like there's two guys on each side of him, and his arms go around their shoulders, and you just see his arms. It's like it's like he has two grown men in in each arm, and it's like and it's like this dude is huge. You know, Jesus. He, yeah, he's he's just a big raw bone, just a big dude. Yeah. Did you catch the podcast they did with Rogan about talking about how he came over from uh, where he was, or where he uh, immigrated to Morocco, and they would they would throw him out in the desert and like try and leave him out there to die and shit like that? No. It's Sipe? A, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. Oh. Uh, Nugano. Nugano. Um, it's a great. I'll I'll play a little bit for you after after we get out of this, but it's a great story to check out. Um. But yeah, he had tried to get into Morocco a couple of times and eventually gets into France and he was boxing over there for a while because that's what he wanted to do. And then he eventually got into MMA because that was easier for him to get fights right. and he made more money doing that. Um, it's a great one to check out. But yeah, with what they're doing with him and, and kind of pushing that storyline, I, I kind of want to see him win and, and see how that goes. But I, that's what I'm excited for. The other fight I'm really excited for on that one is uh, Vulcan... Or, um, Alexander Volkanovsky, Brian Ortega. Ortega. Yeah, I really, I'm, I'm, I want to see that fight so yeah. bad. That's that's gonna be such a good fight. Ortega looked crispy yeah. in his last fight. Volkanovsky's there to get hit. He's just so damn tough. Yeah, and, I mean, he's got a motor on him. He's he don't quit. You're thinking he's almost out, and he comes back and, you know, like when he fought, um, he fought Holloway twice. Hollow, uh, um, uh, who's the guy? Alpha male. Uh, are you thinking of a? Uh, let's see. He fought Holloway twice. He fought Aldo. He fought Chad Mendez. Mendez, Mendez was this close to taking him out, and and then he he slowed down, and Vulcan also just turned it back up on him. Where it's like he took punishment, you know. So he's not only he's good, but he's tough as nails. Yeah, too. you look at you take a look at his record. You you don't really like you see they fought. You know, Chad Mendez back in 2018, he fought Aldo in 2019, he fights Holloway twice. Um, all by the sit well, he, the last one was split decision with Holloway, unanimous decision the second time around. 
uh, one by decision. Do you see him trying to play, trying to go the long game with Ortega with this? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think he's always looking for the finish. Ortega's boxing is really good, and he's again, he's got six submissions. I would say his jujitsu is yeah, so fucking slick. I mean, but uh, Volkanovski is really hard to keep on the ground. Yeah. I mean, he's so strong, it's hard. But I mean, I mean, I think if Ortega, if he wins, he's either gonna be up very similar to what Max fought, how Max you know fought, fought him, you know, and so it'd be close there. But if he gets him on the ground. I think he might be able to get him, and that would be—I would think it would be later in the fight, not early in the fight, because he's early in the fight. He's going to have more gas. Yes, he's going to yeah. feel more strong, more explosive. Wear him out a little bit, and then get him down, kind of like Jan did to Israel. Yeah, you know, he didn't really go for the takedown until later in the fight. And that no, who else was the last one? I was like, oh, Woodley. Woodley is fighting. Last time I got a flash, I should have kept that open. Uh, Vient. God damn it. Disable ad blocker. All right, whatever. There we go. Oh no, I can't even pull it up now. You know what? He's fighting somebody. <laughs> yeah, I forget that. I know. I know who he's fighting. I can't think of his name, but the guy is a really good striker. Vicente. Vicente Luke. Luke. Yeah. yeah. Luke. Yeah, but yeah, a really good striker. I mean, so he's got you know Tyron's. Again, Tyron's biggest thing is his mental game too. If he's on. He's he's dangerous. It's scary to hold pads for him. I mean, it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's scary how explosive he is. Well, yeah, coming off that back foot, he just yeah. pushes and he yeah. closes distance so fucking yeah. fast. So I mean, he's again he struggled. So he, he, <laughs> he struggled. Obviously, he struggled in the last few fights. But what he didn't get, he didn't get enough uh, credit for. He had four title defenses in one year. Yeah. Who, what champion, there's no other champion you can say has had four title fights in one calendar year. And he was fighting guys that people didn't have answers yeah. to. I, like, I, I thought he had handed Wonderboy his second loss. Or no, it was the uh, the split, it was the draw the first the time. Draw. And the second time around, it was, it was a, split. a split decision. Yeah. But they were. But he was the first one that kind of figured out how to take Wonder Boy out and get a win over him. And yeah. then you kind of saw people kind of following that same yeah. outline that he kind of drew. And the same with Damian Maya when he fought him is that, you know, nobody had an answer on how to finish Dam or not necessarily how to finish Damian Maya, but how to stop his, his takedown. takedowns. Yeah. And, and, you know, he'd shot, I think, 22, 23 times in the five rounds of that fight. And he just wore Maya out on letting him shoot. And then you see everyone else after that, that that was kind yeah. of the blueprint that everyone followed. They followed the Woodley blueprint yeah. on how to beat Maya and how to beat Wonder Boy. Um, well, Wonder well Bo actually, Wonder Boy's only losses were to Woodley and to Pettis within the last year. Yeah. I don't even know what his first loss was for. Uh, the, uh, Brown. Matt Brown? Matt Brown. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's early in his MMA career, but he's totally evolved, you know. So, I mean, it's been a lot of that, the credit of beating uh, Wonder Boy has got to go with Duke. Because Duke grew up in that style of fighting, so he understands that his brother, uh, Duke's brother Rick, was one of the best in the world in that style of fighting. So he understands that movement, and uh, he understands. You know, it's like people get up, obsessed with the in and out. Oh, he's going away. Up, they go back and forth. Is like, you know, when Tyron beat him and when Anthony knocked him out, um, they what the, they what were they doing? Forward, forward, forward yeah, forward. Forward. I mean, a lot of that those wins are is with Duke. Duke knows how to beat that style. Duke, he's got one draw and two victories against Wonder Boy. Yeah, you know, I don't think any other coaches have come close. Nobody to that. has yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> Wonder Boy makes everyone look mediocre. Do you, uh, you know, just out of curiosity, do you see Wonder Boy fighting Kamaru Usman for the one seventy title at all anytime soon? Uh, if he if he can put a couple fights together, and it would be a lot. I think I mean that his style is I mean, if you it's one thing oh I'm just going to go doing that but his movement understanding his range and everything else is so good that people don't get it they don't understand how hard it is like who do you just, Jeff Neal mm -hmm. I mean he he made Jeff Neal look silly I mean he didn't like beat him up crazy but Jeff Neal was never really in that fight yeah you know, he just couldn't get anything off. You know, it's like, it's one thing to bring somebody in to imitate him, but you know, the timing and the movement and everything yeah. else, if you don't understand that, it's a whole nother story. And Wonderboy is a lot bigger than people think. 
you know, and, you know, and Anthony got in there, like, oh, he's not that big. Then on fight night, he's like, oh, shit, yeah, he's a pretty big dude. <laughs> <laughs> and I think Anthony is the only guy to knock him out. I think you're right. Yeah, because yeah. I thought Matt had a decision over him. Yeah, but yeah, and Tyron Tyr- 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 almost had him knocked out. Yeah, but on well, that that fourth round yeah. of the first one, yeah, he almost finished him. And then what did he go to? He went to a guillotine. Yeah, yeah, a guillotine from his back, it, and he yeah. couldn't. And I remember him saying it was not. It's not his good side. The other side's his good side. Yeah. That's the side he but likes jumping Anthony, guys yeah, with. Anthony. You know, you can say what you want. Oh, yeah, Anthony had a bloody nose. But it was a bloody nose from jabs. Yeah, just, yeah. It wasn't, like, devastating punches. And you know, was saying, and he just took the space. Anthony did one dynamic movement in that fight, and it was over. Yeah. And everything else, because it was a set up, set up, set up, set up. People don't realize the leg kicks. We're going back to leg kicks. Anthony was leg kicking them. You know, and you can say what you want, but if you don't feel them, you know, you don't know. It limits your movement. And then... Wonder Boy did something. He normally moves his feet away. And when Anthony caught him on the knockout, he leaned away. Yeah. And you don't know his legs might have been compromised. It was like he leaned instead of moving his feet. If he wouldn't have moved his feet, that probably wouldn't have landed. Yeah. But because he leaned, you know, and a lot of that was because of the the leg, leg kicks, kicks and everything that else that and Anthony was landing. You know, Wonder Boy in general just has a really weird style. He's hands down. He's bouncing back and forth. And he's got well, that really long, like that really wide well, and, karate base. Well, it's point. You know, for that karate, that style is points. And if you get touched, it's a point. You mm-hmm. know, it's like they shield a quick touch. They learn there, and so they learn instead of like blocking, they don't block. They move. They avoid because if you're blocking, you're probably going to get touched and you're going to lose on points. With well, so they they avoid. With a guy that's as tall as him, with him moving back, does he? Do you see a concern for him being able to be kicked because of the fact that you know I'm used to the idea of your, you know, you can rush a guy like that and they move back. You can hit him with a kick. You hit him with a leg kick. You hit him with a body kick, head kick as they're moving away. Is he just moving that far back that he's out of range for it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, but that's just it. You. I mean, Anthony was getting success with the leg kicks, but he also Anthony didn't back up. I mean, he didn't do anything fancy. He walked up into him in, a, in like a tie, more of a high-handed tie guard, and everything. Like I said, it was like he it was like he was just breaking them down, breaking them down. And like I said, people think so. I saw the bloody nose, and they're like, "Oh, and he was he had to come back. He was getting tore up. Was, he had a bloody nose. Big deal, mm-hmm. you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's, so yeah. Wonder Boy is a tough matchup for anybody. Do you see that being successful against a guy like Usman, that wide base, that hands down? Like, I, I mean, there's if, there's a length difference between the two of them. Even well, though Usman's kind of big for that division, yeah. do you see do you see that kind of working? If I don't know, if, Wonder Boy I, can put one more win I, together. I would actually see if uh, Usman trying to do to uh, Wonder Boy what he did to Woodley, just get him against the fence and grind him. Mm-hmm. You know, he, and that's just going to wear him. That's going to slow him down a little bit. So if he could do that, that pressure. That, but if he against can't do that, it would just going to be a it'd be a very interesting fight. If he couldn't get him down, or he couldn't get him stop that move mobility, it'd be a very interesting fight. Because like I said, it's Wonder Boy can make a, a really good fighter look average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he's well, good. You know what, Kush? We I just realized we're we're coming up on two hours here, and uh, I wanted to say thank you for no, for doing this with me so. again. Um, I know the first time that that we had an audio issue. And I was I was real thankful that you agreed to, to do this right away. I'm actually still working on trying to clean up the audio on that. I had an idea the other day that I was like, maybe I could reroute the audio to a left and right channel and, and maybe that would work. Um, but I'm going to take a look at this tonight and see after I, I take a look at this. But, um, you know, if, if you're listening to this, I want to say thank you again. Big thank you to, to, to Scott Cushman, my little brother, Randon, uh, for producing the show. Also, once again, uh, don't forget, if, if you want to catch these fights, you, you want to watch them with me. Some of my friends and stuff like that. I host the fights uh, every month, every pay per view over at Brothers. Uh, Kush, you're always welcome to join. Real quick, uh, the fights this Thursday uh, in Philadelphia for Brian and Christian are going to be on UFC Fight Pass. Oh, okay. So if you have UFC Fight Pass, you can watch the fights. I don't know the time; it's East Coast, you know, time. Are you so, going out there for that one? Yeah, I'll be. Okay. I leave Tuesday. Actually, I'll be there Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Come home Friday. Uh, follow my social media at uh, at DJ Zero Cool for Instagram. Uh, I might put up a post. I might do this. I might do this at Uncle Bucks, or I might do this at Brothers. I'm gonna, I might hit those guys up. I got to meet with Ricardo this week, yeah. and and maybe come up with something. Maybe I'll just go host that over there for the Thursday fight. Bring some of the guys out from the gym and and shit like that. After we're done doing a advanced kickboxing, maybe catch a shower there and then 
and then take off. But um, yeah, once again, circling back, um, if you want to catch the fight, uh, brothers, it's a place to be. We're going to be doing this um, March 28th, I believe is the UFC 260 card. Let me confirm that really quick. And there isn't a date. Oh, March 27th. Excuse me. So there is a date. March 27th. That's a Saturday night. There's no cover at Brothers. Uh, once again, due to COVID restrictions, there's going to be limited seating. You got to wear a mask. You got to be seated. Um, if you're there, take care of your staff. Um, everyone's dealing with craziness being in the industry, so on and so forth. Wash your hands, cover your mouth, so on and so forth. Do all the things that you got to do. Also, don't forget... If, uh, if Brothers is full again, uh, we got pretty packed pretty early. Once again, show up early. Yeah, go ahead. Um, show up early. Uh, get there early. Get your spots. If you're not able to get your spot and you're stuck out in line, the overflow will go over to Uncle Bucks. Did I just lose audio? No. No, you're good. Oh. Did you end it? No. Oh. I, I cut out my headphones. That's why I was wondering. Um, once again, if you're uh, – where was I? Yeah, the overflow. So uh, if you're stuck in line at Brothers and you're literally waiting to get in, you can go over to Uncle Buck's. Uh, they're going to be hosting the fights over there as well. They're going to be my overflow. So if, if you're outside the venue and you're not able to get in, go over there. Lawrence, Ricardo, those guys will take care of you. I believe that's everything. Shout out to Greg Huber over at Santino's. One of the baddest motherfuckers I know. Makes an amazing fucking pizza. I see him every weekend. Love that guy. If you get a chance, go over there. They got a they got a wood grill or not a wood grill wood burning oven that they do their pizzas in and it's amazing he's got a great atmosphere uh, great for date night um, that is it that's for me um, also if you're looking at sponsoring this um, I'm gonna now take on sponsors now we got everything working we got our audio and our video under control now so if you want to sponsor this uh, you can email myself or you can inbox my little brother who's producing the show uh, DJ Zero Cool spelled out at gmail.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. And, of course, if you got questions, comments, uh, feel free to hit like, subscribe, uh, drop the comments in the YouTube comment section or in Facebook. Once again, everyone, thank you for joining us next week. Chris Farrakis will be joining us on air. We'll be talking about uh, the old days of Oak, Site 1A, the artist they had coming through me there. And then his, uh, he's got a huge interest in crypto now. So we'll be covering that as well. Once again, everyone, thank you for tuning in. Be well. Take care. Mahalo.